everyone. Welcome to the um, March 12th um, meeting of the Midfield School Committee. We were just in executive session to discuss strategy with correct collective bargaining and the threat of litigation. If in an open meeting, it may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body. We're going to start our meeting tonight with Chief Meany, um, who is working on storm preparations in addition to many other things. Um, just for the sake of um, efficiency. After that, we'll have public input. We have the approval of the minutes from February 12th. Um, then we have new business. We have the appointment of the Director of Student Services. Any other items since, po since posting on March 7th, 2018. For old business, we have the fiscal year 19 budget update, donations, the superintendent's report to the committee, and any the future agenda items will also include the fiscal year 19 budget. Good evening. Chief. Chief. Uh, we asked the Chief to be here tonight um, to just give kind of an overview of some of the work we've been doing the last few years in terms of school safety and also talk a little bit about uh, following up to what we discussed at our January, end of January meeting when we talked about access to the building. Uh, you know, we've worked really closely with the, the Medfield Police Department to develop um, some protocols and, and lockdown procedures and all of that. It's worked really, really well and I know Chief um, appreciates it and we have a great relationship so Chief, if you want to just add anything to that would be, be great. Sure. So the first piece of good news is I was at a meeting in Middleborough a couple hours ago and I was driving down there, the cell phone goes off because I have this location based thing and they're officially going to have a blizzard down there so we're just going to have a whole lot of snow up here. So just, you know, that's that's the, the first piece of good news for us. Anyway. The superintendent cancels school anyway. <laughs> I, I, I heard that. Um, is, so that's an accurate statement. It is okay. true. Okay, that's true. Um, yeah, so, you know, we all understand that uh, security, especially school security, is a real significant issue. It's nothing to be taken lightly. Um, one of the good things that everybody should know uh, is that the schools and the police just we talk all the time it's a rare event if we don't go like I think, two days without speaking and it's not necessarily all about bad things it's about things like where school sports teams are in the playoff and get ready you might be able to meet the bus at the town line and bring them in so there's a lot of positive stuff that goes on. Uh, one of the key elements to that is Michelle Manganello, detective, school resource officer. Um, I did a lot of it before then, and I'm sure people were getting very tired of me. And, you know, Michelle has just stepped up, walked into that position, and done a really nice job. She spends a lot of the time here at the middle school and high school but she also goes to all the other schools. She also ends up doing all the uh, scout, troop, scout troop tours of the station uh, and just knows the staff, knows the students. I think people feel very comfortable with her. I don't think anyone is the least bit hesitant about walking up to her. Um, on the other hand, um, having gone through many training exercises, um, you know, with a detective and been at many scenes with her, you, you also need to know that she is the last person on the face of the planet Earth that I would want to mess with. Um, she can just totally handle herself. So I just really, I feel very comfortable that we have someone of that caliber working here in the schools and with everybody. And, you know, she has conversations with people at 9 o'clock at night, Saturdays, Sundays. And so the communication is always going on. Um, not the least but unusual for me to get a text from Dr. Marsden, for him to get a text from me. So, the, so you just really need to be comfortable that we're always talking. If there's something going on that we're a little concerned about that we're hearing around town, right to wherever it needs to go the school principals, uh, the counselors, any of that, there's just no hesitation on our part to, to share things that need to be shared. And it goes back the same way. So, and it doesn't always happen like that in all communities, but here I, I can tell you it's, it's just seamless. And for any of you folks keeping track of my whereabouts, 
Yes, I did spend some time in February in New Zealand. Um, that's where my daughter lives with her family. Yes, we pointed out on the globe that it is on the opposite side of the planet, um, but we think that may be a plan that my son is going to be left to take care of myself and my wife in our old age. We're not sure about that. And during that time, John Wilhelmy, the deputy chief, he was in charge. I'm looking at my emails, I'm all, and you know, there's just nothing that he couldn't pick up and handle. So just understand that the thing is seamless. And I'm not going to tell you that everything is perfect. Nobody should ever look anybody in the eyes in 2018 and say, yeah, I haven't got a thing to worry about. Everything's fine. We've got it all. No, that's not. I mean, there are, there are very crazy things that happen in our world. Um, when I, uh, the second day I was in New Zealand, the top section of their major newspaper, and it was Sunday's, was the New Zealand police say that mental health, mental health issues are their top priority. So it doesn't matter this hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, we're all, we're all suffering with issues that we have to deal with. Um, we try to be, um, you know, very pre as prepared as we can be here in the schools. We went from, when I started here 12 years ago, working with Bob McGuire, that he and I would simply walk around the schools and pull in all the doors. And then the principal would get a report card as to what doors were locked, what doors were unlocked, what doors needed maintenance. I think by the time Dr. Marzen got here, we had pretty well the, the maintenance issues squared away and the doors were secured. Um, again, that's not absolutely ironclad perfect. We're going to find that on occasion, but, you know, Detective Manganella was all over that also. Uh, the other thing that you should know that the police officers all have, in addition to all the stuff in my pockets, <laughs> is we have fobs. Um, I have one and there's one in each cruiser. So this gets us into the school buildings on either side of the buildings, opposite sides. So we can get in this way. If we need to get in during the school day, there is a lockbox that you know, the fire department puts outside on both sides of the building. Chief Kingsbury saw to that um, so that we can get in that way. And if all else fails, um, in, in a fit of, um, you know, trying to sort out what else we could use, I have this really ugly tool that weighs a lot that I'm not going to show to Mr. LaFrancesca, who has to be in charge of school maintenance. But if something happens and we can't get in by way of the key, yeah, we're, we're getting in. There'll be some repair work to do after we're finished, no, no. but, you know, we're, we're getting in the building. Uh, and you go back to Columbine. That was a watershed in how law enforcement responded to significant issues within the schools. At, at that time, you did. You, you stood around the school outside or outside of any building where something was going on, and you waited for the SWAT people to come with, you know, the fancy clothes and the weapons and the helmets and the vehicles and all that. Well, we learned that wasn't it. So real simple, um, you know, we do have plans of all the various buildings. We have floor plans. Um, the Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council that is our backup, they have all those plans. But the bottom line is, and we practice this starting, well, I was over in Wellesley at the time, but 15, 18, 20 years ago we started practice, and I know they did here. You just hear the sound, you go to the sound, you deal with the issue, and then you do whatever needs to be done. So no need for maps, no need for diagrams, no need for computer programs. We're, we're just coming in the door, um, and we'll deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. On the other hand, um, you know, in doing the safety drills, as they're called, as opposed to, um, you know, the actual lockdown, there's also a whole other use for that. And the other use for those drills is that if we have something like the two people who held up one of the stores in the center of town, crashed their car at the end of Pleasant Street, and took off for parts unknown, and, you know, now we got to decide we gonna, what are we going to do with the schools? And in that particular case, this was the gang who couldn't do anything right because shortly after that happened, I mean, it really, I, I, I grew to hate CSX and the railroad gates, but the gates came down, the traffic locked up, and 
four hours later, one of my officers walked into Royal Pizza, and there they were, literally around the corner from where they held the place up, having a sub sandwich. And, you know, he took them at gunpoint and locked them up, and they couldn't even get out of town, these poor folks. But if we have things like that happen, you know, a house break, a bank robbery, um, the uh, gas company Tiki Torch in the road over here at South Street mm -hmm. last year. We don't necessarily, we are not going to do the lockdown. We're going to go into high. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mr. Parger, Mr. Vaughn, want to let you know you have a Tiki Torch in your backyard. Probably get the kids in from the school, from the fields, which we did, mm -hmm. and then you make another decision from there. If it's, if it's 10 o'clock in the morning, do we take the kids from here, move them over to the middle school, drop back, punt, sort out what we're going to do. So we've got various levels of things that can happen and preparations that we already have sorted out and what we're going to do. And I'll tell you um, right up front that I'm, I'm not going to tell you precisely what we're going to do because, you know, I, I don't want everyone to know precisely what we're going to do. Um, but, I, you know, all I can tell you is we're going to go to wherever it is and we're going to deal with the issue um, and do whatever we need to do. We've done um, simulation training um, using the simunitions, which if your skin is exposed, it basically feels like you get whacked by a bee, it turns red, turns black and blue, you get a welt, and you know that you fouled up. So we've done that within the schools. Matter of fact, he was my partner. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know. they never forget. Yes, right. And you know it's a <coughs> simulation. You know it's not for real. You know there's no bad people. Yeah, try to tell your heart and your mind that. You are pumping and you are set to jet and ready to go. And we have practiced those situations uh, here in the school, and, and we'll do that again. Um, so the training that we can do can be incredibly realistic. We do training with that with the officers. Um, Officer Manganello, uh, Detective Manganello, there's a person who thought he was going to approach her with a simulated ax, and he ended up taking the door off the side of the head, being knocked to the ground, and having her standing over her uh, in a matter of a count of like three. Um, so we train for these things. Um, and we're always, when we do the safety drills, I will bring in officers from other towns to go along and do it with us. And they'll do, oh, you know what? Over and so we do it this way, okay. Or, oh, never thought of doing that. Okay, I'm bringing that back to my town. So that the surrounding towns that will be coming to help us, um, they've seen the schools. They've been in the schools. So they, so they know what's going on. And you probably, you know, you've noticed over the years all the doors are labeled. So part of that is for if we need to respond. The other part of that is the Medfield ambulance is tied up, the Millis ambulance is tied up. And if you tell them go to the Wheelock School to the small gym, well, you folks are all going to sort that out, but the folks from Millis aren't going to sort that out. So we've got those labeled. Everybody knows how to read those doors and what they mean and what order they go in. So um, we have practice with other people. And I'll tell you, if you ever thought for half a breath that um, the cavalry doesn't come without being called and begged to come, uh, when they had the incident in Millis a year and a half, two years ago, I happened to be by the railroad tracks. Um, I knew exactly what they're talking about, down 109, Villa Street, take a left. And I was there before they even had the line pulled off the fire truck to put the fire out of the cruiser. And I stayed there for no more than seven or eight minutes, then immediately knew it's time to get back to Medfield to try to look for the red pickup truck, which didn't exist, but that's okay. Um, just in the time I was there, oh, there were probably 12, 15 more cruises show up, and that's like under six minutes. So if something happens, uh, you know, just step out of the way because the cavalry's coming. And they're all trained just like we are. Hear the noise, go to the noise, deal with the noise, then we sort things out afterwards. So, you know, I'm as comfortable as I can be that, you know, we're okay, but we, we're constantly looking at new ways to do it, different ways to do it. Um, one of the things, um, you know, how do we deal with people who are not in the building all the time? How do you let those people know what they should do? The folks who we hear all the time, they know what to do. They know where to go. Um, we're going to, we'll step it up and we'll do one of our safety drills at some time during passing time. Mm -hmm. 
um, during lunch um, and mix it up a little bit. We're not going to just do the simple standard, everybody knows it. You know, you have to do it and you have to try to file people up a little bit to make them think. And people are not, the, the staff are not told, okay, you have to do this, this is the only thing you can do, and don't change your mind. You just don't think. We tell them to think. If, uh, if people feel that the best thing to do is to leave the building or go to another section of the building and that's their decision, off and running, go do it. We're not going to lock people in literally and tell them they can't move if there's a more intelligent thing that they feel they should be doing. The school staff here, they're intelligent folks. These are brilliant folks. Um, and the students themselves, especially middle school, high school, these are sharp people. Um, I, you know, I, I give them a lot of credit. Um, so, but I, I'll tell you one of the biggest things I think we need uh, out of all the various options that are being considered, and it's a short term and it's a long term goal, but one of the things that any police officer has noticed is that the increase in the mental health issues that we deal with and people who are under stress have challenges have problems that stuff is not easy and more and more well who i mean it, it's us i mean who's around at three o'clock in the morning it, it's us so the police are dealing with that so the training on just like we're first responders and we can help your bleeding, we can breathe for you, we can pump in your chest, we can do all those sort of things. We're also going to, and we've already started, working on how to deal with mental health emergencies. And I realize that, I mean, there's nothing fancy after my name other than comma JR, okay? I don't, I'm not a psychiatrist or a physician or an attorney, but I know there are things that I can do to help, and most important, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to say something or do something that just puts a person right off the edge and just fouls their day up more. So there's a lot of consideration in how we do that. Uh, one of the things that started this fall uh, is the suicide prevention uh, consortium that you know we I think well we were supposed to meet I think Wednesday night. We'll we'll see how that works. That 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 may not may or may not work. Mother Nature may have a, a little discussion with us about that. But that's been a great tool in bringing together an entire cross-section of the community to work on, you know, a significant and a concerning mental health issue. I, I, I don't think that if, if we can all help it, I don't want people to get to the point where they think, that's all I got left. I don't want that. I want it to be better. I want people for them to be able to go to and talk to, you know, and I think a lot of folks feel comfortable going to Michelle and talking to her about issues, whether it be school, staff, students, parents, you know, um, you know she's not going to growl at you, you know, although if you aggravate her, you know, <laughs> stand, stand clear because she'll be able to handle it. Um, but I, I think the most important thing is we continue to communicate all the time and we are not fixed in one solution and only one solution. We're always looking in better ways to do it. You went down over the February vacation and heard the principal or the superintendent? Superintendent, Newtown. The superintendent from Newtown. And you want to talk about lessons learned uh, and imparting that wisdom uh, and sharing it so that we can sort out, all right, is there something different that we can do? And we take input at all levels. There is nothing slapped in my forehead that says genius and all the information's here because it's not. I'm willing to open my, uh, open my ears and shut my mouth and listen to what people have to say because these are your, these are your students. It's you know, part of your staff. It's, it's all part of the community. And the more we talk, the more we work together, the more we're willing to be open and shift our way of thinking, that's how we're going to you know, deal with this stuff. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to look at you and tell you that, oh, we got it all sorted out, it's perfect. You know, sleep tonight, don't worry about it. Don't worry about a thing. I'd be crazy to tell you that uh, because th things are not perfect. They don't always work out the way you want them to work out. But our hearts are in the right place, um, ears are open, mouths are moving all the time, and, you know, anyone that has any ideas, we're very willing to accept them and to listen and to work at trying to make things as best as they possibly can be. We don't have our feet stuck in the mud. We're willing to change. We're willing to listen. 
and do whatever seems to be appropriate. So Chief, the, that's the my spiel. But <laughs> the access issue that, that we've talked about, um, we had a faculty meeting with teachers last Monday and talked a little bit about some of the things that went on. And, and one of the concerns that one of the, the folks in the music department had was just the access uh, after hours. Mm. And um, you know we've yep. talked about it here too. And um, we've had the principals talk to their colleagues. I've talked to my colleagues, superintendents. Everyone seems to be grappling with that same thing. You want the school to be the hub of your community. You know, you want everyone to be there at different meetings or whatever, and then you run into a situation where, in this case, we have at least three doors open in, at night um, for, for us, either sports or music or main lobby uh, meetings and those things. I mean, that, I know we're still trying to work that out. We're still going through it, but uh, I'm sure you've, you've discussed that when you were in Wellesley and other places. That it's, yep. just a, it's a concern. Yeah, and, and there are some schools that still have open campus at 10 o'clock in the morning. There's a lot of them. They're, they're, they're fine with the doors being yeah. unlocked, and, and we're way past that one. Yeah. Uh, and not right. just because of the uh, of a really bad thing happening. You just need to know who's coming and going right. in and out of your buildings. So yeah, we've been trying to sort out, you know, to use a limited number of doors, who's coming in, um, you know, and people need to be comfortable approaching folks. I would hope that if you know I didn't have this uniform on and nobody well if I didn't have this uniform on and I walked over to Westwood to an elementary school and walked in I, I would hope that within a few minutes someone's gonna excuse me who are you what are you doing here but when you get to middle school and high school you have people at different ages coming in after school they might be doing things they might be parents or grandparents coming to build sets put costumes together any of those sort of things that right. You know, because as you say, you want the community involved in the schools. And then we've got to figure out that fine line. We're, we're not to the point where we're going to just lock the doors and say, N no, you have to have, uh, you know, three, 72 hours advance notice coming to school. We're, we're not there. But we've got to sort out something that we put a little bit more control on it than we've got. Right. Yeah. No two ways about that. Yeah. yeah. Chief, um, thank you for coming in. As, sure. You know, somebody who's got a freshman at Medfield High. Um, first of all, I want to thank you because, you know, over the course of years, we've heard a lot of, you know, students making bad decisions in Medfield that could otherwise have real significant consequences for them long term, and, and you've worked with the, the school department, with families to make sure that you keep kids safe, you help them make good decisions without creating a permanent record for them, and I, I think there are a lot of towns where that doesn't happen, and it only happens because of the partnership you have here. Um, but when we, you know, my daughter was here when, when the alarm went off during the storm, and she came mm. home, well, she, she texted me, terrified while it was going on. Yep. I'll bet a lot happened to a lot of people. It, the instant communication now doesn't give the school department a lot of time to, to really figure out what's going on and respond. But, um, you know, one of the things that occurred to me, and Jeff and I have talked about this, is there are some towns that do sort of, you, we, you talked about the live fire drills you did with the teachers. Um, and there are, you know, new teachers who don't necessarily it didn't get the same training as we gave last year, and we need to update that. Yep. Um, there were some problems with, you know, with the intercom system going down in some parts of the building, they couldn't hear the all clear. Um, and that's, you know, we, we've gotten a report later on about how to um, figure out why that happened with respect to electrical overload. But, you know, what, and I read the article from Northeastern University that says schools are safer than they've ever been. And that may well be true. It just doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel us, it, no. Right? no. Nope. And so, you know, what's your experience um, and Jeff's your experience? Because the, the, uh, one of the things the Northeastern article said is that live fire drills or live action drills with kids don't do any good. And it, it advises against them. And I think that's part of the reason we haven't done them before. Do you have a different experience? Because I wondered if our kids had been through a drill before, they might have a better sense of how to have reacted. I think no matter what happens when that alarm goes off, there's going to be panic. But um, do you, either of you have a sense of whether that makes well, sense? I think that the, the issue that day was... <clears throat> You know, when we do safety drills, we come on and say it's a safety drill. And everyone does their thing and they know where to go in the room, they do all that particular piece. I think the, the thing that caused the anxiety and, and the issues for both staff and kids was that the recording says this is not a drill, this is a lockdown. Mm -hmm. And kids knew that was, everyone knew that was not a safety drill at that point. So that's, you know, that brought it up a whole new level. And I, and I think for the most part, and, and Chief, you talked to the staff as well, for the most part, uh, kids and staff did a really good job with it you know they did a really good job there were some that that didn't react as quickly as they should have but did react eventually um, and there were some that that didn't handle it as well as we'd like but for the most part 
kids did a great job. Kids went and barricaded the doors. All the things that you know we've we've trained for. You know, and um, it was just unfortunate that folks had to go through that. You know. Yeah, and, and the and weather was one, scary to begin with. In one with sense, for in one sense, adults, it was good right? in the fact that it identified some areas that we still have to do better on with speakers and that kind of stuff. But it was unfortunate that everyone had to go through that in that particular thing. But have what is what's the experience at other districts with live? So other other places have done it. Um, mm -hmm. Other places have mixed reviews. Um, gone in and simply uh, started firing the starter pistols, and with no notice to anybody at all, um, regardless of what's going on during the school day. And we don't do that. And, no. and we're not there. No. Yeah, no, I, I, no, just, I can't we're, imagine. We're, doing we're not there. Um, just can't. And. So where we are is that get the baseline strongly sorted out and then make things a little more complex. One of the things that you, you may or may not, you know, that Dr. Miles probably shared you, with you with the fire department is on occasion what they do is they take this piece of plywood that's painted up like a bunch of flames and they put it across the corridor and up, oh, can't go that way. Now we've got to think in which way do I go. And then with the knowledge of the principal and the staff, hi, you third grader, you step over here and let's see if anyone notices that you're missing. Right. And they did, they did. So little by little, you make it more complex. So the, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is doing it during the passing time, which is gonna make it much more complex. And the more complex it is, the more people have to think, what would I do right now? And I do this all the time. I'll be sitting at the lights at, at North and Maine. I'm like, okay, right now the bank alarm goes off at Bank of America. What, what do I do? And Inside the chief's mind. Yes, <laughs> right there. Yeah, and that's, that can be a dark and like scary we, like place. Like when we go to lunch and you won't sit with his back to the door, those right. kinds of things. Yeah. Yes, yeah my, oh, yeah, my my wife knows that she has to sit with her back to the door and I have to see the door. Um, you know, there are just these things you to do. But the more complex a situation is that we put people in, they're gonna to start to think, these are sharp people. They're gonna, okay, what, what would I do right now? When you, are you talking about drilling with, with teachers or drilling with kids? We're, we're gonna, we'll do it during passing time with the students. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that will, that'll be a challenging day when, when we do that one. Um, you know, I want to clarify, though, that we're not talking about doing live fire drills no. with the kids during no, passing no, no. time. I no, just, no. just want to make sure yeah, that we yeah, are fully yeah. clarified on no, that. Um, well, middle school, high school, they're the ones who do the most passing between classes. So what we do is, my opinion, is I would ask the staff at Memorial Dale Wheelock, okay, we've done this several times. How do we up it? How do we you know, should we up it and how do we up it? Over at those schools, really, the staff are the people who, who are the lead safety people. And the young folks, they're looking at that classroom teacher, you tell me what to do, and pretty much they're gonna do it. Uh, you know, you get to here, and the students are gonna do some thinking. And they're gonna sort out, if I don't feel comfortable doing this, I'm gonna do something else. And if there's one desk there, and there's three people from the football team, and I think we want two desks there, then that second desk is going up. I got no question about that. Um, but yeah, we'll make it more complex, but I'm not gonna do it all at once. And then at some point, we really need to sort out doing it like at lunchtime, but we gotta, that we really gotta figure out because that's gonna be when lunch is not, huh, we, don't, we don't wanna mess up lunch too badly. But we've gotta sort out different times, different situations so that you know the, the young folks can understand. But I'm not, because one of the things about the live fire, um, you can do that in a section of the school and hear nothing, 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 nothing in the, in the other end of the school. Like right now, maybe you go, what was that? But if it was way down that far, wink down the auditorium, <clears throat> they're not hearing anything yet, really and truly. Um, so that, you know, y'all, that's why people need to know that we're all going into lockdown you know, and be able to react appropriately. But there was, no, there was nothing that I would do without running to pass the superintendent first. There have been some places where the, you know, where a law enforcement person has come in and just decided we're gonna do this and see what happens. Yeah, that, that, that's not gonna happen here. That's not how I do things because to a certain extent, when we do the safety drills, we wanna find flaws and we wanna find issues so we can fix them. 
But on the other hand, I, I don't want to set people up for total failure and leave them with a feeling like, oh God, if that happened, there's just nothing we could do. I don't want that. I want them every time to feel that, okay, that was better than the last time. That was better than two times ago. All right, comfortable, you know, don't like it, but comfortable doing it. <coughs> and, you know, the, when, you know, when the power came on and we had the issue with the lockdown, um, you know, you were here. And I'm just pulling back out. Uh, I was at Dale Street. You were at Dale. When the message went out, yeah. And my understanding is in about 30 seconds, you could hear a pin drop in this building. They, it had been dealt with. And that's huge because everyone thought that was it. And they did it. Students and staff, outstanding. So I would never do that. <laughs> I would never sit around and say, okay, I think next Thursday I'm just gonna go down and just wouldn't do that. It happened. And it's uncomfortable and all that, but people performed. People really stepped up and performed, and that's that's what we want. Because, go ahead. Sorry. So I think we all agree that that past Friday, with the, when the alarm went off, it was a less than perfect day. However, what I appreciate is the sentiment to improve. And I think not only did they speak to the staff, but they really listened to the students, and they got a lot of feedback from the students, and which I think was critical. So that was one comment. And another question I have, though, is we have a lot of new hires, subs, for example, who have never even been to our schools. Do we have a webinar for them, like p paper and pen, in terms of, all right, read this, take a little quiz. H how do we so prep assist, our new people? The principal sit with them before they go in the classroom and go through that. Um, and then some, again, some of those folks had a different reaction than others. Some were really good, some were not. So maybe that training yeah. can be looked at yeah. for in terms of a bit more of a formalized. That's one of the things we uh, we sorted out early on, and I was part of a uh, a drill in another community, and it was the same thing. The sub didn't know what to do. Where's the key? How do we get this done? How do we get the door secured? And so we sorted. That was probably two couple of years ago. We sorted out, but we got to figure out something the folks who aren't in the building all the time. And also, you know, if there's a parent in the building just helping out, you know, with the students or with scenes or whatever, it's during the school day, you know, that, that'd that be nice to have them know what's going on also. Yeah. yeah. The more people that who are comfortable in knowing what to do in a miserable, rotten, uncomfortable situation, the, the better off we are. Mm -hmm. The more likely it is that someone will see the person go, hey, you're coming with me, just go this way uh, and do this. Uh, and we also reassessed, I think, some of our, um, some of our aides for the classroom so, they, so the, people would, the students would know where to go. So we've got to take a look at that in other than classrooms. Because if we're in passing time or it's lunchtime, there's a lot of other places to go. And where's a good place to be in that particular room if you're a student and you don't go in that room real, real often and there's no guide for you? So we, we kick that around also. Jeff, when, when teachers start in the district, they have to do an extra couple of days of training before yeah. the rest of the teachers, right? And I know, you know all of our staff, at least here, and if Blake had a full day of training last year, I think, you know, I know in those two days it's very tight, right. getting them oriented to the district and mentorship programs and everything else that we provide for teachers when they join the district. But I know my daughter was in a, a classroom with a teacher who was new to the district. And I think that you, it sort of fed into the problem. Right. Um, I know there's not, you know, you could add two weeks to the orientation for new teachers to, to any district um, in order to cover everything. But I think, right. we, you know, we need to find a way to, I think, deliver that message a little bit better to new teachers. Because they don't, you know, we can't get them when they start immediately to go through a full day of training like the rest of our staff has had and will have again. Um, but we do have to find a way to get them more or less yeah, on board. With definitely part of the mentorship. Yeah. yeah, no doubt about it. But then yeah. in addition to, uh, you know, the assistant uh, principals going over with the teachers, you know, Detective Megan Ella can also go through it with them also. Uh, hi, did you understand everything they said? You really know what, you, <coughs> what you're supposed to do and just review it. Yeah, or go through scenarios, role play, yep. or, you know, things like that. Yep. So. Yep. And that could be a conversation you could have with the folks. 
I wonder if um, we could talk about the, the facilities, the, sc the physical facilities in the district. <clears throat> and I know, you know, the Dale Street School, for instance, and I know we can't talk a lot about it in open session, but at some point it might not be a bad idea to discuss, um, you know, the Dale Street School is going to have state-of-the-art built-in systems around school security, but these schools oh, that, that uh, yeah, right, <laughs> true, true. Um, but these schools that are that are older need to be retrofitted. And I know we've done a lot of work on it in the last 10 years, 12 years, and, and some of them, like this school was built, you know, when we at least had some awareness, but it still has a lot of work to do around that. Um, and I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be bad for us to have a, a I know some districts do it in executive session, because there's, there's an exemption for security discussions, mm -hmm. that we could discuss what are the, with, with um, Chief Meany, what, uh, where, what he, like almost a school by school, where he sees some of the issues, where he sees where we may need to be spending capital, you know, where he sees the priority around that. Um, so, because as we start to move into, you know, like this capital stabilization fund we're talking about right. in the budget, I think it would be helpful to know that and, and understand a little more about what can be done, what makes sense. I know it evolves a lot, you know, there's different, there's a totally, it seems to me it changes kind of pretty regularly what people view as sort of the right approach to security. Yeah, I think that like right this fiscal year, we're in the last of the three year investment in right. security upgrades. And I suspect some of those upgrades we made in the first year, it's been $20,000 a year. Some of the upgrades we made in the first year are no longer state well, of the art. I think, I think yeah. we need even, you know, yeah. 20,000 is not probably right. sufficient. Right. But I think it would be good to help, you know, to, for, for us to understand what it is that uh, sort of the long range priorities around that. Maybe we could do that even, you know, in the, not in the next few meetings, but fairly soon. Yeah, and, you know, I can get very specific along with, you know, both of these folks as to what we think would help. There's, there's no question about that. And, you know, I, I don't want this to be any mystery, but I mean, some of the things we, we're, that I don't want to discuss is like if we had to relocate the students, where we're going to relocate them to. You know, you just got to please trust us on that one, that, that we're going to do that one right. I, I don't want to advertise that to folks. You know, I, we'll, we'll get that done. Um, but, you know, there are many things. You know, the, the bottom line is something's going on. We're just come sailing in those doors, and we're just going to go deal with whatever it is as quickly as we can. There's no standing outside. There's no waiting for the second officer. There's none of that stuff. You just in you go. And, you know, that, that's, that's how we do it. The, the technical little pieces afterwards, you know, we'll sort out. But, you know, we have plans such as where we would have the parents come to reunite with their students, where the media is going to go so they can gain access to the sky and get the satellite coverage done because I know they're going to be clamoring for that. We, you know, those things, we've got those sort of things sorted out. But very happy to, you know, do whatever, go through it building by building. Um, I'll, I'll say I'm fairly comfortable with the interior of most of these places. Uh, and I, I know where there are some things that I'd like to see a little bit, a little different, a little better. I mean, one of the brilliant things that, um, you know, just covering up those little slits of the windows. And uh, I'll tell you that Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council that's a consortium of 46 cities and towns. And we just pool all our resources and people are trained in specialties. And when you, when you need one of those special <coughs> specialties, they'll come. It took about three people, about some five or six minutes, with just basic tools to try to get through your typical classroom door that's your wood and steel. Those things work. So when you've got the window covered <coughs> and the door locked, and they can't waste time. You know, they're just, I'll just say it, they're under volume, so they're gonna go to the next place. So if you can hold people off for the three to four minutes till the cavalry comes, and this is the one time where I'll, I'll just tell you this, because everyone's gonna know this anyway. Uh, when we come on something like that, the idea is with lights and sirens and absolutely positively as much noise as we can possibly make so that the bad person knows it's just about done. So if you're going to make a decision to do something yourself, might as well do it now because we're coming in the door. And that's typically what happens. Um, 
before we ever set foot inside the building for what a law enforcement does, the issue is done. <clears throat> Florida, I'm going to tell you, that was a little different. But the person then, you know, dumped whatever they had and was making their way out. I have no idea what the thought process was there. Um, as I tell people, and, a, and a, a Sergeant Geary has told me several times, do not try to put um, your rational thoughts into an illogical, irrational mind, because it's not going to work. You can sit there and spin your gears all day long trying to sort that out. So don't bother, just deal with it. Um, but yeah, happy to do anything you folks want. Uh, this is really, when you think about 9 o'clock, well, not tomorrow morning, but 9 o'clock, maybe Friday morning, there's a huge, well, I'm just, I'm just making, it, making sure we're there, okay? I, you know, just making sure. I mean, if this we're is until Friday, we're going to go to school until right. July. Right, east. <laughs> this is a huge population of people that's within our school buildings, some students, some staff, some parents, some support personnel, and really the rest of the town, I'm not going to say it empties out, but a lot of people go after their jobs, and this is where these buildings are where the population is that I think about all day long. You know, the individual houses are, are very likely empty. The businesses, you know, there's things going on there. But for the large populations, the, these school buildings, this is what I think about during the day. Um, you know, Montrose also, the daycare facilities, those are the places where I sit around, okay, something happens right now, how am I gonna do this one? Right down to the point of, if I hear the train coming through, it's like, okay, I'm not getting to the other side of the tracks by that crossing, I gotta go this way. All day long, you know, that, that mind, mm -hmm. for whatever it's worth, it, it's, it's grinding around all day long uh, on that sort of stuff. So, but this is a huge, this is my population of people that I'm really responsible for at 10 o'clock in the morning. Thousands, really, right? Mm -hmm. This is where it is. So please don't ever think that this is anything like <laughs> second, and I got to, that is, during school time, this is it. That's why we have a person assigned specifically in the little town of Medfield with only 18 of us on the police department. She's in the schools. That's her job, period. It's that important. And I want we should recognize, by the way, because that was, that was a decision we made jointly a couple of years ago, and I think it's been it's paid dividends tremendously. You know, it, it, that, it's such an improvement from the old dare officer model. That, I did know, that. Yeah, that, that was nice, but yeah, nah. the, you know, the, the, the nope. kids the kids know you, and they you know they 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 like to see you around. They you know they expect to see you around. I think that does add to a certain sense of security and familiarity with law enforcement, so you don't you know not in Medfield because I know most of you guys too. But when I get in another town, if I see an officer behind me, sometimes my heart starts to you know, speed up. Was I going too fast? I never do in Medfield because all my family and friends have kids here, but other towns sometimes I go too fast. So but your heart doesn't come in your throat when you see one of my guys behind you? No, because I Darn, know you're there to keep something me wrong. safe. I know you're there to keep me safe and that I would, and so I, I, I think the kids appreciate yeah. having you in the building. And I, I you certainly want to thank you for that because you know, sometimes when I come in in the morning, the first, first couple um, months you're here, I'd pull in to drop the kid off and i think, I have the police in the building, and I start to think about it. Now, I, you know, I expect to see here. Yeah. And, you know, the comment you made earlier about um, how we treat young people, you know, I can get criticized for this. I am not a big person on stats. I'm not concerned at the end of the year, the town report, how many people we locked up, how many people we summonsed over to court, um, you know, how many people we, we nabbed at the red light and laid on the fine as hard as we could. That, that's not what I'm about. Never been there. Um, if you want someone that's going to do really hardcore law enforcement, you need to find another person to be behind this badge because when it needs to be done, yeah, we're going to do it. But really, um, and now that the age of being a juvenile has gone up to 18, I mean, one of my goals is to try to get everybody out of, out of these buildings and out of the world without a criminal record because <laughs> You know, I may be able to stand here and, yeah, right, yeah, Jesus. I, Sometimes it seems like we have less control of that. Right, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I know, and, and there may have been some times in the past when I may look back and say, I can't believe I did that when I was in what grade? And so, you know, we've all been there. We all know 
that we don't make the most brilliant decisions when three of our friends are around us saying, hey, why don't you go ahead and do this? And, and I get it. And you know, so if every now and then we gotta bring somebody over to court, okay, we're gonna do that, that's fine. But for the most part, we try to you know, pick them up, dust them off, ship them down the road, some consequences agreed upon with the parents and the schools and, and, and sort it out. I'm not in the stats, never been in the stats. You're gonna need a, somebody else if you want the stats because you, you, know, you won't get that from me and I know that's not always popular too. And just one more comment about uh, the SRO, Shelley, and that is not only has she been brilliant with the kids and the schools, but just the other month at the high school PTO meeting, she came and spoke to the parents because um, as, as, a, as a high school parent, many of us have a lot of angst about what our children do on a Friday or any other night, and um, sh she was there to um, just talk about what's going on and what she does and what we can do. So that, that was great, so thank you very much. So she's been a great resource to parents. Thank you. Chief, we've kept you a long time. I, if I can ask the chair for, uh, or make a suggestion to the chair. I think a lot of folks are, want to talk a little bit about, more about what happened um, on that Friday. And if we could ask you to stay for a few minutes. Jeff, I know, has a report from Jerry McCarty Dr. Marsden has a report from Jerry McCarty about the, the mechanics about that, and that may weave into further questions from us to you about that, if it's all right. If you need to go, you should say so. But. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, you, you've got me. All right, is that all right with you, Madam Chair? It is, why don't we move to the... Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll step off to the side. Thank you. And you can throw anything you want at me. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. I would jump yeah. down to the, the damage yeah. report. Okay, report. Okay, I think it ties into a lot okay. of that you can do that. Yeah. Uh, so in your packet, we had, we had a report from Jerry um, on the damage from March 2nd. Um, and I can go through some of these just so you get a sense of what it is. I think it's important for everyone to understand. <clears throat> so at the high school, and I hope my voice holds up here, um, electric and HVAC, as a result of the uh, vast fluctuation of street power, which caused the generator to continuously cycle on and off as well as possible electrical panel circuitry issues. The high school suffered low voltage drop issues on some circuits. Um, power to most circuits requires 110 volts and we documented random circuits were around 50 and 80 volts. Um, by not having the proper 110 power it caused some equipment to burn up and fail because the unit failed to compensate the low voltage of the power feed. It should be noted that the equipment that had low voltage systems in them that had battery backup and direct 110 volt circuits such as the fire alarm operated properly and had no problems with it. So that's one of the things that we're looking at um, for the other systems within the schools is putting the battery back up. And we're getting some of that, some of the quotes on that now. Um, some of the issues we had on the rooftop units, which are gonna be very expensive. Um, so we had failures to RTU 1, RTU 2, RTU 14 and 15, 8 and 6. Um, they shut down completely and we're, at, at this point, this is from the 7th, uh, awaiting component replacement and um, control uh, repair. So we're looking at the, the repair of each one of these at a minimum would be $300 just for the part on the rooftop units. Um, the unit ventilators are in each classroom that supply. So does that mean there, there's no heat in? No, there's nothing to do with the heat. And those are AC and, and air handling and some other things. Okay. Um, so it's the, the back portion, not the H portion. The right, so the, so the unit ventilators are where the heat in each classroom. Um, that controls the 110 power. Um, and and that, this particular time, uh, Jerry, Robert, and I, and guys in the maintenance were running around trying to find where they were burning up. So the, the actual unit ventilators um, were burning up and they were smoking, it was an awful, mm -hmm. awful smell. So it had, one happened in the art room, uh, one happened in um, the social studies area. There was a couple, there was four of them total that went and it was really, really smelled awful. No danger, no issue. It's just that they were, they were, they were premature failure on the transformer. Um, and Jerry is saying that's going to be $500 per unit. So we're looking at least four units there to replace at the high school. But they're uh, working, we just think that right. what happened to them is going to cause right. to fail some. Okay. Uh, so the, the swipe card lock system, and that's what Chief was looking at um, with the, the fob he showed earlier that we put in a couple years ago. 
Uh, the swipe card system relies on 110 volt to be transformed down to 12 volts to operate the locks. When the system is not receiving a clean 110, it could not operate properly. The system could not read the signal and locked up and failed to read the swipe cards. The key locks were operational, so we could use the keys and everything, we just couldn't use the fobs. Um, as of now, uh, the system is working, but IT is working with a vendor to best transform and ensure that no damage has occurred. So it's two of the bigger issues that happened at the high school, which I know folks are concerned about. Uh, the PA announcement system. The system requires 110 volts and transforms the electrical signal to the speaker down to 12 volts. Um, this may be 24 volt system, but the same principle applies. Um, what was experienced during the power issue that some building wings had no issues and received the full voice signal. Other building wings had minimal electrical signal when speakers were barely audible. The system worked, but the fluctuation in the power to the transformers and the different wings and boosters failed to provide a consistent signal, which resulted in vari varying decibel levels in the school. As of now, the PA system is working, wherever IT is working with a vendor to determine where the power fluctuation is affecting the equipment in an effort to rectify this problem. So we had <clears throat> the vendor in last Thursday, so the day we had off. Yes, um, bless you. And they were going through, and one of the things that the Friday before revealed is that there are spaces in the high school that are being used that were originally not classroom space. So those didn't have full speakers in there, so that was part of the issue around, around hearing it. So we added speakers in cafeteria, and then certain areas too, we're adding a lot more speakers in there and tying them all together. Um, so that was one of the big findings uh, that, we, that came out of that Friday. So the lockdown button, and it is a button. So here's, here's where this whole system came up. So a couple years ago, we sat down with the two vendors and said, you know, we, in my former district after Sandy Hook, we added, um, we added panic buttons under the desk of office folks so that they could press a button and that button would go to the um, alarm system company in say lockdowns. So it wouldn't be anything audible over the, the school. It would just send a signal to the alarm system and then would send it to the police department. No one will do one right to the police department. They just won't do it because of liability. Uh, so taking that concept and learning what we learned in Sandy Hook, what, which was uh, when something like this happens, it's really difficult for someone to go on a PA system and make a lockdown announcement. And in Sandy Hook, when the person was doing that, what was going on in the office was audible to everybody in that building. So we, did, we want to avoid all of that. So how can we make it so that we take that panic button concept and put it into a lockdown? So we had two vendors come in and we kind of, we, we threw this concept out, what can you do when they put this in place? So it is a button in the office of the middle school and the high school. It's not triggered by any noise or triggered by anything else. The automated part is, is that the principal's voice comes over. They don't have to make an announcement. It just presses the button and the automatic announcement goes on. So that was the issue um, that the kids heard and the staff heard was that particular one. Um, now, this had, when we lost power one morning earlier in the fall, uh, we lost power, it was like 6.55 in the morning. So it was only some staff in the, and it came on at that point and it shut right down. So we thought we had to fix it at that point. Clearly we didn't because it wouldn't have happened again uh, on that Friday. Um, so now we're working again with that vendor making sure that doesn't happen. And what we had mentioned with the, with the fire alarm system, it needs a battery backup. So Owen is working with them to do a backup so that if we do lose power, it's not gonna get a surge from the generator and it's just not gonna go off again. Uh, so that's, that's what we're working on right now. And, and the issue is, I, is, am I right Jeff, it was less losing power as much as losing power, getting power, losing power, getting power. So right. It kept fluctuating between the direct feeds and the, and the generator. So you and it wasn't a full 110, it was 50. Almost was testing some of the outlets, it was 50, 60. Okay. Um, so we were, we were trying to hook up a backup at that point, we couldn't even do it because of the, the voltage. Um, <coughs> so can I ask just a question yep. about the, the lockdown? I, mean, I think we installed that with part of that three year we did. security commitment. Um, is that still, is, there a, is that a warranty issue? Or, I mean, are they coming in and trying to remedy that or was that gonna cost us money? Well, they're going to try to remedy that. I'm sure you know, every time they walk in the building, it's going to cost money. So I think there's going to be something there. Um, our thing is we thought it was fixed. So that's what we're going to. That's what we're working on right now to try to get that. Well, they came in full switch. Right, right. right. So, so I mean, they, that's that. I was our understanding was that it was fixed. Um, so that we're working with them, and it's 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 a PA system company and an access system company. So the system, the company that does the key fobs, and the company that does the, the PA system are working together on this. So that's. You know, that's kind so of the issue too. You got two different. there's a liability to, um, there will be no button connecting the school to the 
police. They, they won't touch that. No. So who contacted the police when this happened? So that part of the protocol within the school is that when that lockdown goes in, someone in the office dials 911. Someone in the office, someone in the not office. the security company. Correct, because okay. it's not wired into that. Um, so there's lots of people in the office. I mean, that's how one person is going, is going to do that. Um, this, this particular is different than the other one I had where it was a panic button underneath and goes to the, the alarm company. This one doesn't do that. Okay. So it, it goes right into, into the lockdown. So um, what Jerry had said here, uh, this system is also 110 volts that gets transferred down to 12 volts interact with the PA system and other related control systems. Um, it would be my opinion that the, trans the transformer related to this equipment also experienced a low voltage in the 110 power and the transformer low voltage failed, activating the system. IT is working with a vendor on this to address this. That's what Owen is working on right now. So there's a few things that we have to do corrective action wise at the high school um, on top of the lockdown in the PA system. Um, one is the generator. Um, so one of the things that we found with the generator that is working fine, it's great, but it's not giving con consistent uh, power to where it needs to in the, in the building. So, um, so Jerry's working on that. Is that because it's not strong enough or it's not? It's, it's more, the, the generator itself is fine. It's where the power goes, it comes in. Um, he feels like it wasn't, um, wasn't properly set up that way. So when you wire it, you want it to feed certain systems. Right. It's feeding less critical systems. Like for instance, on that, that Friday, this main hallway had all the lights on. Mm -hmm. Typically that doesn't happen. Typically it's, it's a pair of lights that go all the way down. So it's bright enough to see, but it's not bright like it normally is. This entire hallway was lit up. And then other hallways weren't, so it was just it was just off. You know, it was really off. So he needs to test the electrical pa the panels. Um, he's concerned that the obvious power voltage drop at various circuits. Um, he's going to seek quotes for electrical inspection companies to test electric power on panels at the high school and also at the middle school. The testing would look for bad and loose power connections, failing circuit breakers, and other electrical abnormalities that uh, could cause power drops in the circuits. Um, there was also roofs and on top of the HVAC, there was some roof issues that you know he's been addressing. Um, one of them was uh, a piece, one of the covers uh, blew off in the wind and of course as it blew off, the, sh the sharp hit every single way around and made slits in the roof up top. So he's been working to fix that. At the middle school, um, HVAC suffered some similar issues but it's, it's very less, sophist it's less sophisticated than the high school so it had less problems. Um, middle school has similar type of problems with electrical. All the issues will be addressed similar to the high school. Uh, the middle school did have lighting within the school act randomly and consistent, much like we had over here. Because of the randomness of electrical problems, uh, the building will also require testing to electrical panels to determine if there are repairs that need to be rectified. Uh, some emergency light circuits will need to be addressed immediately. PA system, uh, swipe, swipe card system, and lockdown all being evaluated again. It's the same thing that happened at the high school. Roof repair, more leaks. Uh, Memorial School was the last one we had some issues with. Um, the rooftop unit, because of the fluctuating street, street power, uh, the unit condenser failed. And, um, and that's the, the one that cools off the servers in the headroom. So it's really important. It controls all the, <coughs> the servers in that area. Um, and it, it's, he, thinks, he thinks it's 15 years old, so it's not repairable at this point. Uh, we're looking at an estimated cost between six and 7,000 <coughs> to repair that. And that has to be done immediately because of the fact that it's <coughs> the head room uh, for all of our servers. Uh, and then roof leaks were inventoried and um, will be assessed. So the, it was really a high school, middle school, and memorial. Um, Wheelock and Dale, surprisingly, had uh, no issues. Uh, so, I mean, it was a lot to it, it wasn't just a malfunction of one system. There was just a lot of issues going on at the same time with that. Uh, and are there, have we done any evaluation about whether insurance is going to cover any of that? Um, I, I think Jerry is talking to Michael about that. I'm not so sure they'll cover a lot of that, but um, we're looking at it. And it's, it strikes me, first of all, I appreciate that. Generally, we don't talk about the high level security that you just talked about. But I think people are, my daughter was terrified, so I'm, I appreciate doing that. Um, is there a better way to make sure that you, you chief and system chief and Dr. Manginello get the protocol by having somebody call 911 seems <coughs> unreliable. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about that. Is there a better way that anybody's thought of? I don't know. I mean, that's pretty typical. 
Um, <clears throat> so you could do something like use a radio. Um, however, typically, um, if it's not a radio that you're used to listening to every day and this call's coming in all the time, it get, you may not pick up on it. So the, the dialing 911, <coughs> especially if it's done from the landline, landline exactly. that tells us that's where we need to go, okay. period. Um, and, you know, for those of you who don't know, if you do, if you dial 911 on your cell phone right now, this is going to go to the least busiest state police answering point. Mm -hmm. So it may be Framingham, it may be Foxborough, it may be Boston. Now, they're good. Um, and they're going to just shift the call right over to us in a short period of time. But on occasion, we will get calls from Mansfield, Medway, and the inevitable Medford. Um, so, that, so that does happen. I suspect that's probably the biggest. Yes, yeah. yes. And, you know, for those of you who, you know, met Richard DeSorge, you'll know that the man has chest pain over that. Um, <laughs> we're not Medford. Um, so the best thing is landline. So the landline 911 is... That's the best way, because if all they can do is dial 911 and that's it, that comes into the system, that comes into our building, it's locked in. That's it. We know precisely where to go. And is it, it's probably not possible to tie the button in because they won't do it, they won't do it. automatically dial 911? And, and I think their concern is that if everyone is depending on that company's technology to and work, it fails. and it fails, yep. they're holding the bag. So they're like, yep, yep sort it out, Matt. They wouldn't do it the other town. Yeah. You figure it out on your own. Okay. So landline 911 is probably the best thing. And you know, I don't know that we've done this before with the safety drills, but now that we talk about it, maybe when we announce the safety drill, we let the dispatcher at the station know that you're going to get a 911 call hmm. saying that we're doing a safety drill. So that every time we do the drill, somebody in the office sure. dials 911. And we're set up for it. We know the call is going to come in, and we just make that part of our drill. Sure. So that when it happens, it uh, I got to dial 911. I have to do that. There'll be four of them in there fighting for the phone. I'd like to see redundancies in that as well. There's no reason that anybody who wasn't within the reach of a phone couldn't dial 911. Certainly, they would never get disciplined by us. I think that if something comes over the line that says this is not a drill and this is a lockdown, and I'm near a phone, and my kids are taken care of, I, I would think that 911 is a very short thing to do. You know, the teachers are given that option. So the well. teachers are yeah. given that option, yeah. mm -hmm. but yep. so, so there is yeah. a level of redundancy so mm -hmm. that it's not just depending on one person. Yeah. And so you'll know um, if that does happen, and, and say for instance, um, 25 people down 911, and they're all on landlines in Medfield, will, we have, I believe, is it four ring to pick up the phone? Three. Three, okay. We got three rings to pick that phone up, and if we don't, it goes to Walpole first. Over to Dover next? I think Dover's backup. Yeah, I think Dover is our backup. So that if we're not picking up the phone, you know, there's an assumption that something has happened <laughs> with the dispatcher in Medfield. Yeah. Yeah. So we got three rings to pick it up, and then it goes to Walpole and they got a certain number of rings to pick it up, and then it goes to Dover. Now, the bad thing about that is there's lots of calls coming in, and dispatchers are trying to field calls. But when you think about it, if the call overflow goes to Walpole first and Dover second, hey, they give it out to their cars. There's something going on at the high school in Medfield that they're not picking up the phones, and then they listen to the radios, and without even dispatching, they're in the way. <coughs> so that may not, that's not the worst. When you, you know, when you think it all out, it's not the worst thing anyway. You get two towns notified, and if it really gets bad, it goes to the state police. And, you know, the state police love to come. So, you know, we're gonna, <laughs> you know, we're, we're gonna have, so, you know, when you think that out, lots of people call that landline, that's eh, not the worst thing on planet Earth. Or even this one, because if the PSAP in Framingham at the state police barracks, gets six calls from the Medfield High School of people screaming. Well, someone's going to, they're, they're going to get in their radio and say, just start driving to Medfield. So, you know, maybe that's not the worst way to get the cavalry starting over the hill. 
really, when you think about it. But I think putting the uh, putting somebody in the office dialing 911 and maybe two or three people as part of the safety drill, mm -hmm. nice thing to add on. So if we hadn't had this thing tonight, we wouldn't have thought that through and come up with that. So another good reason to have a meeting like this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, that was a lousy 50 minutes, <laughs> but I'm glad we did it. Chief Detective, <coughs> thank you for coming in. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so the next item on the agenda is public input. Oh, if you have anything to say, you can come up to the microphone and just state your name and your address and what you'd like yeah. to talk about. What you'd like to talk about and give your input, public input. Right. Thank input you. Input away. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening. Um, thank, my name is Linda Salisbury, and I live at uh, 57 Colonial Road. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Um, I am here as a parent of a theater, high school theater student, as are a number of people here. Maybe a show of hands. How many people are here for this topic? Okay. We are here to discuss um, specifically uh, compensation for staff of the high school theater program. So um, <clears throat> uh, just I'm going to sort of discuss just a few facts and some data that I've collected and then let others in the community have an opportunity to come up and talk about um, their perspective on the value that the uh, theater program brings to the high school and to the community. Um, so the high school theater program has approximately 100 students that are members of the program every year. They put on three productions. There's a play in the fall. There are uh, student-directed one-act uh, production in the winter. And then in the spring, we have a musical. So some of you may have seen Pippin, which ran this past weekend, which was pretty fantastic. Um, now, the reason why we're here today is we are very concerned about the underfunding of compensation for high school uh, theater program staff. So what I've done, um, together with help from a few other parents, is um, I did some uh, data collection, some benchmarking um, of the stipends that we, um, that we offer in Medfield Public Schools and compared it to some comparable districts nearby, um, I found that um, there's data that's publicly available through uh, teacher, associ teacher association contract agreements. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to, <coughs> just through some um, internet searches, to collect some information to help us understand where we, um, we stand relative to uh, comparable districts. So let me just share some of that with you. I actually have paper copies that I would love to share with you tonight and leave with you. Um, so here in, in Medfield High School, we do fund both the middle school and the high school uh, theater programs, but I'm gonna focus just on the high school theater program tonight. Um, so we have um, the stipends that are um, listed in the, the Teacher Association contract agreement for 2015 through 2018 um, totals $10,403. There are four stipend items in that, um, in that list. One is for a, a theater society coach, which is currently um, staffed by Ms. Andrea McCoy. Uh, there's the assistant to the theater society coach, uh, currently staffed by Mr. Ryan Lepresti. Um, there is the um, director of the musical, which we just had Pippin, and that is Ms. McCoy. And then finally, there is the uh, musical director for the high school musical, and that's uh, uh, Anne Marie Trembling, our choir director. And those stipends together total the 10,403. Um, as a, a group of parents, we are particularly concerned about the compensation for the uh, director, Ms. Andrea McCoy. Her total uh, compensation for the entire year is $5,944. Um, and that, um, 
uh, her, her role encompasses many hundreds of hours uh, that I don't, I don't have um, access to that data, but um, certainly uh, the compensation is uh, far below um, what you would expect someone with her, her training, which hopefully someone else can speak to that because I don't know exactly. I didn't collect the data. Yeah, pardon me? Masters in theater education. Now, just to give you some comparable numbers um, of some nearby school districts, uh, again, I have it in detail here, and what you'll, one of the things you'll see is the districts sort of um, slice up these roles differently, okay? So I, I described what we have, and other schools have other uh, roles that they, they uh, flesh out. For example, um, there's a stipend for choreography, uh, for set design, for sound design. Um, uh, we, uh, one thing we don't have is we don't have a stipend to fund a director for the play. We don't have a stipend to fund for the, uh, the, one, the student run one X production. So she is essentially working for free, um, uh, directing those productions. So just a few, uh, comparable numbers. We have, um, Westwood, um, spends, uh, based on their, their, uh, contract agreement. Their number is um, $30,900 for the high school program. That funds two shows and the roles that are, um, are uh, associated with those. They currently, at the time I collected the data, which was about three months ago, um, they had one additional show that they were proposing and it was up for, um, up for uh, approval. And that, if it does get uh, approved, their budget will then increase to $35,900. Another school district nearby is um, Natick. Uh, in their program, I don't know the size or number of productions, but their entire high school uh, stipend totals $21,523. And then lastly, uh, right down the road here at Dover Sherburn, their high school program, again, I don't know how large it is or how many, um, how many productions they put on, they fund theirs at a total of $17,203. So um, I will uh, share this with you because you'll also get to see some of the um, differences by line item. For example, for directing the musical, our director is compensated $2,972. Uh, whereas at, uh, let's see, um, the director of the musical at Westwood is, I'm sorry, that's the, the, is compensated $7,000, $7,500. Okay. Now we, so when I, realized I could find the data through the teacher association contracts, that's when I began to understood um, the process by which these stipends are, are determined through the, the contract negotiation process. And um, I understand that now that is ongoing with you, of course, and I don't know all the details of that process, but one of the things that I and other parents here wanted to do tonight is bring this to your attention because we would like to um, influence that process and hopefully um, convince you to increase the stipends uh, for the high school theater program. In addition to that, uh, we would um, love to hear um, from you some potential um, possibility of what we might do to correct the situation for the current um, school year since the new contract would not apply to this year to see if there might be a way that we could compensate the, the current director. We are very concerned about retaining her. It's her first year here at the district. She's done an amazing job with the program um, and, um, and you'll hear some, some anecdotes from families, but we are very concerned about retaining her going forward um, because um, it's, she just can't afford to work here. I would guess, you know, without knowing all her personal finances. So um, that's why we're here tonight, and I, I'm going to cede the floor for other parents to talk about their, their personal experiences. But I do want to share this data with you. I'll, I'll hand it to you now. While you're doing that, I just, mm -hmm. I, I'll just say that um, we appreciate you coming in. We're happy to hear from all of you or any of you. 
Um, because it is part of collective bargaining, you won't hear anything from us about it. I we're understand not that. Yeah. To bargain here, um, either with respect to the current year or prospective years, it's just it's not it's not fair to the union or to the individual teachers. Yeah, I understand that, but we thought that as parents that we wanted to speak to you, to Dr. Marston, as well as the school committee, to raise your awareness of the situation. Um, I did meet with um, Mr. Parga, myself and another parent did, uh, on, back in December, and um, we were surprised to find that he wasn't really aware of a lot of the, the, um, of the details of the stipends and some of the issues related to, to compensation. And at the time we asked him about the possibility of um, maybe being able to fund um, some immediate sort of correction to that because we were concerned um, about that. And um, he thought there might be some possibility through a process through the town. Um, he wasn't really sure. He said he would talk to Dr. Marsden about it. Um, we have not heard back on, on that, so we would be interested in knowing, is there a possibility? Um, I don't know where the funds would come. It could be from the district. Uh, there's also a parent booster group that might be interested in, in contributing some, in some way to um, encourage her to, to, to stay here at the district uh, as a kind of good faith um, uh, sort of uh, uh, gesture that we do in fact value her very much and hopes that she continues on in the district. Thank you so if I, if I may just, yep. so uh, mm -hmm. a couple of things. I emailed a couple of parents this, um, this morning actually. Um, so we, myself and um, the subcommittee of the union have spent the last couple of years <clears throat> looking at, in preparation for negotiations this year, looking at stipends across the board. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that we found when we were looking at and having a discussion is that the stipends haven't been part of the conversation in collective bargaining for many, many years. So many years they've just kind of stayed the same and they rolled over. Um, many communities you'll see that that they'll, they'll apply the cost of living increase to stipends that wasn't happening here. So they, they're pretty stagnant in terms of their amounts. And uh, what we did is we looked at Westwood, Holliston, Huffington, and Wayland. So those are the four communities that we're using as our benchmarks. And we're trying to look at all the stipends. And again, you find that some people call them different things. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to get apples to apples as far as that, that stipend and try to make a correction on all of them. Now, we, we did the work for about a year and a half, I guess, not, not a full two years, and um, put a proposal together. They submitted it to me. We went through it all. Um, that proposal alone to bring all of the ones that we think are important, and again, I was part of that process, is an additional $400,000 in the budget. So. That's just, and that's across the board. That's just not theater, but that's curriculum, stipends. Um, uh, athletics weren't as far off as others um, we were looking at. Um, so we, we felt like we got to come up with a way that we can do this in, so that we pay our folks that, that deserve it and get them up to where they are everywhere else, uh, but do it in a way that may take more than just one year. So that's what we're looking at right now. It's part of negotiations. We're, we're fully aware there's going to be movement in the stipends going forward. That's something that we have as a goal. Um, Mary Ann and Anna May serve on that subcommittee. Um, and certainly the Teachers Union has that as a goal as well to, to really make some adjustments there. Um, I looked at Christy Barney. I don't Christy here. I don't know if she's here. No, she's out of town. Okay, so she had sent me um, some information too. Uh, I think you were on that email too. Mm -hmm. yeah, both, mm -hmm. both were on that email. Um, and some of those numbers were shocking. I yes. mean, the difference was shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, when you get a stipend and you look at, what Westwood has, and that was one of our comps, that's an accumulative stipend that keeps going year to year with cost of living increases or revisited every couple of contracts. It just hasn't been done here. You know, in, in the last contract negotiation that we were all involved in, it really never came up as, a, as anything to discuss. You know, so I think it was concerted effort with the union and, and me. We, we sat down and looked at it, and we're, we put that together, and that comes up to the school committee as part of negotiations. But we recognize it's, it's, a, it's, it's out of balance, out of whack, there's no doubt about it. In terms of what we can do this year, I'd have to, you know, we have to sit down and look at it. I'm not sure we could do something financially with us, uh, but maybe work together with boosters and do something. But I think that um, we've had a lot of feedback this year, um, positive feedback from, from what she's been doing. So mm -hmm. it's been great. Certainly, this weekend was a testament to it. The kids did a wonderful job, and she certainly did as well. Um, I'm just always amazed that at the work that our kids do every time I go, which is just amazing. So I think that's, you know, that's something we're working on. It's totally on our radar with negotiations. It's not something that uh, we're dismissing. It's really important to us. So 
Okay. I just think it's important to know that. One, just to, as a follow-on, if you don't sure. mind, I just want to note one thing, and you'll see it in the data. Mm -hmm. So in addition to looking at the, the uh, teacher association contract agreements, we did reach out to a few districts to try to see if we could kind of understand some of these line items. And there are a couple of districts where the stipend number doesn't fully represent how they fund the program because they have a full-time faculty member oh, okay. that allocates a certain percent of his or her okay. time toward the program. So for example, Wayland you mentioned, yeah. if you look at the Wayland number, the stipend is only $7,039, but additional funding comes from um, somewhere between a quarter and a .3 full-time equivalent drama faculty gotcha. salary. So, okay. Yeah, thanks. So the seven thousand plus fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, I, I um, of course don't know where any how all the funding works at the at the um, at the schools, but I do understand that the um, that the the theater program uh, does generate quite a bit of revenue through ticket sales. I say that as the person who managed ticket sales this year, <laughs> so it's it's I feel comfortable uh, uh, with the accuracy of the numbers. Um, and I did bring those tonight because I wasn't sure exactly how these things are funded, especially for um, uh, for the theater program. I know there's a budget uh, somewhere um, in the uh, in the district for that. Um, Pippin was awesome. Uh, we sold uh, over a thousand tickets. We sold 1,133 tickets for Pippin alone, um, which generated $16,290 for the theater program. Our uh, ticket sales total for all of this school year, the three productions, The Snow Queen, Medfield After Dark, and Pippin, together those three totaled $29,208. So the theater program is uh, generating revenue that potentially could be used um, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. And I, here, let me share that data with you too. There you go. Does anyone have any questions or? Oh. Just a cut. Uh, uh, so if the, the program, we couldn't get a theater director the program ended, we would lose I collect the money, but then I hand it to the school, so I can't, I can't uh, speak to that at all. It doesn't go to the school department. It goes to the student activity account. So those dollars have to be spent for students. But it's not spent for the students. But it's not spent for the students that sort of bring, bring it in, earn the funds. You would have to talk to the high school principal. He manages those accounts. But, I mean, we know it's not spent for the funds. Okay. So. I, I, I have no. That, but that's true with respect to, I mean, with respect to everything that we take in for any student activity, it goes into the general student activity fund and has to be spent in your student activity. Yeah. So Even it's, the revenue kind of like purchasing mm -hmm. tickets, like I understand the activity fee, but yeah, for, uh, yeah. So, but, so the funds that you're talking about, just the ticket sales, that does not include the activity fund that the kids pay to be in theater. Is that? The, well, that's the, separate. That's yeah. separate, okay. The activity fee you pay is separate. Okay. The, the dollar amount I, I quoted was just only tickets. tickets. Because I managed that this year, so I knew the numbers. So the kids all pay an activity fee separate. I'm sorry, if it is public forum, we'd love to hear from you, but you do have to come up and identify yourself. Okay. Oh. Well, I'm Julie Sinnott, <laughs> but I'll, that was just my question. Um, what was the budget for Pippin? What was the I, budget I have, I'm not involved in that. I don't know that kind of data. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, anyone else? Um, and like Chris said, um, I'm part of the collective bargaining um, team. And while we can't speak of it, it's definitely on the radar, and there's been a lot of work done on the stipends. But we so appreciate you hearing and giving us numbers, and um, because obviously it's an extremely successful um, program for so many children. So thank you. And your kids um, were awesome. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So fantastic. Um, and does anyone else have anything? Yes, please. 
Hi, I'm Becca Cornett. I live at 23 Curve Street, and I can't quote any numbers, but I'll just kind of speak from the heart to, um, first of all, I appreciate um, what I'm already hearing that um, I think we're on the same page in terms of how important this is. You know, we are all, I won't speak for everyone in this room, I feel lucky every day that we live here and our kids get to go to these schools. I know that schools across the Commonwealth and the country are cutting arts programs left and right. Uh, I have three kids in the public schools. My son is in college, he graduated, but I have a senior and a freshman. For example, my son is a graphic designer in college and he took art classes and every single semester and he still didn't take every art class this school has to offer. We are so lucky. So it kind of feels greedy, but I'm gonna be greedy. I think we need the arts in schools. It's so important to just be civilized people. And it's gotta be beyond academics and athletics. My daughter was just in the show. Thank you so much for your note this morning. It was awesome. <laughs> it, was really, it was really fun. <laughs> Or everything she knows. No. Um, <laughs> but she, <laughs> uh, yeah, the attitude part for those who are wondering, she acts like that at home all the time, so that wasn't really acting. It's, a lot of jazz. it's like she's with her brothers. Yeah. Um, but I totally lost my train of thought now. But it was, she's been doing theater since sixth grade and she has loved it. Um, but this year in particular, um, this director, has just, it's been a transformative experience for her. I've, I've never seen her just come alive like she did this year. So I don't know, you know, I didn't realize her degree or anything. I just know that the kids absolutely loved working with her. We've always had an amazing program. And as I think I mentioned in my email to you, that to me, you know, I realize this isn't necessarily a budgeting issue, it's a collective bargaining issue, but a budget should represent our values. And to me, I think. For me personally, this is a big value. So I think it's so important in this day and age when so many schools are cutting this that we stay strong. Um, I think it's one of the things that makes our school really special. From the time our kids were little, we were coming to see the high school shows because they were so good. Um, so anyway, just sort of from the heart, hoping that um, you know we can just be a lot of voices kind of making the point that we think theater should be valued and I have just, I don't know what my daughter would have done without it this year. It was a huge part of her senior year. Thank you. James. Thank you. My name's Elaine Sewell Dorr, and I live at 25 Hatters Hill. We are new to Medfield. We moved here in July of last year and have a sophomore son who has been in all three of the productions. And a couple of things about Harry. When we were looking at schools, we knew we were moving here. We had lived in the area before, and we visited five high schools, and Medfield was one of the towns that we were thinking about for lots of different reasons. But when he heard about the theater program, it was very interesting. <clears throat> he was very interested in that. He had done theater in our school back in Connecticut, and he wanted to continue here. And you can tell, if you look at his gene pool, he's not an athlete. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a singer. And so that's why theater was so important to him. And it um, is a recruitment issue for, it was a um, an incentive for us. Academics were of course our highest priority, but a second issue was the theater and music programs. And so that's why Medfield was so appealing to us. In addition, when we got here, the kids in the theater and the music programs have been so welcoming to him. And we were really concerned about this sophomore who had lived for nine years in, a pre in the previous town and how would he transition. And the kids have just been great and they should be supported. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't come up before when I had my question. I'm Julie Sinnott and I live at Four Nye Road and I have a junior, his name is Bryce Sinnott. And Theater's been so important to, to my son as well. Um, it's funny, you know, you try to get your kids to fit in somewhere, right? You just want them to be happy and to have a place. And theater has been Bryce's place, right? Um, we have a, lot, a very open environment here in Medfield, and there are a lot of LGBT students in Medfield. And I feel like without theater, Bryce wouldn't have found his place, right? And he really does have his place here. Um, and all of the kids are very welcoming. Uh, and I just wonder, without theater, 
where would his place be, right? What would he be doing? What would he be into? Because now he cares about school so much, he has to learn to organize his time, which has been really crazy lately. Uh, he, has to, he has to learn to organize his time. He has friends. He knows he loves the, being part of the uh, uh, special needs kids, like helping them. I feel like theater's great for the special needs kids, but you know who it's really great for? Is all the other kids. Because he becomes, he, he loves being with them. He loves just knowing that they're all together and that it's, they're all just part of a friend group. It's just, it's just them, you know? It's like he doesn't think of them as much any different than him. But it's, it's part of what makes our community rich. The theater part is really great. Yes, I'm so grateful. And this director this year has made a huge difference. But I just wonder if Bryce didn't have this and if these other kids didn't have this, what would they be doing? Because I know what I was doing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and no, I, I, I wasn't doing all the great things that Bryce is doing, you know, and I wasn't doing it with all the great kids that Bryce is doing it with. And so I'm so grateful for the program and for our schools, and thank you for all that you guys are doing to make our schools so awesome. So. Thank you. I just want to interject that I'm the sole theater major. <laughs> How do you know? I know. <laughs> yeah. So I am so glad to hear that what applied a very long time ago continues to apply now. And I was really proud of our kids for absolutely no reason because I had nothing to do with any of it. <laughs> but I, as many of you have here tonight, welled up multiple times. Mm -hmm on Sunday, because I just thought, these kids are doing amazing things right now. Mm -hmm. so and they'll carry that with themselves. I'll be very quick. So Beth Thompson, Beth Thompson 223 Causeway Street. Um, to echo what people have said, the, the difference this particular director has made this year is huge. I have a daughter who's a freshman in college right now studying theater and visual arts. Her last year was, was really difficult, and in much part due to what the old director was doing, but um, this new director in particular, my daughter's a junior, Anna, she, and um, a lot of what you've said is this community, she's really brought together just like a team, you know, and to accomplish, I don't, I'm sure you saw on the show, the kids and the energy and the way they all work together. I also have a background in HR, and I know what it costs to replace someone to go through the search process, so I really wouldn't, you know, I know you realize <coughs> that it sounds like you're investigating it, but the cost of that would just be a shame, but again, to speak for this particular director, I think everyone would attest she's just incredible. So again, thank you for taking it into consideration and for hearing us. Thank you. Can you get your closer up here? <laughs> did a good job holding that sign yesterday. Though. <laughs> Upside down. At I was first. sitting there going, "Thank God I'm not sitting in the front." <laughs> oh. Hello, I'm Erin McCormick. And I live in 5 Nye Road next to Julie. And just to reiterate, I appreciate all the great comments, um, especially I have, a, I have a sophomore who's here in the high school, and just the program has made such a difference in her life. I was serving mac and cheese this week during Tech Week. Every single kid who came through the line said thank you. And what it's done for just, it's an amazing, amazing group. And when you think of a town that pays over a million and a half dollars to fix a fit football field, and we're talking about short money to get just, you know, she, the director has to pay more for a babysitter than she does to come to work. I mean, that's ridiculous. And how do we figure this out working together? Let's, you know, I know the long-term answer, but how do we keep this director? Because I can't have her leave during my daughter's tenure here because, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what to do and I will do it. We need to keep her. And it's a short money solution for an incredible opportunity. So tell us we want to do it, we need to keep her. Thank you. Hey, good evening. I'm Alexandra Compton, I live at 15 Stagecoach Road, and I can 100% second everything that all the other parents have already said. We have to keep this woman here. She's really awesome for the, for the, the program. She's so talented. She has put this program back together with teamwork, 
with really a you know, cohesiveness that hasn't really existed there before. I just had one other additional comment, which I would like to consider. It seems that it's disproportionate, the, the activity fee that the kids pay. With a lot of the other programs, you pay per season. You pay for the fall, you pay for the spring, you pay for the, the winter in a track, for example. But with a theater, you pay one fee for the whole year. It doesn't matter whether you do one show or whether you do three shows. Of course, there are, there are you know, costs associated with doing three different shows. So maybe that could be also a, a consideration that could be uh, looked at, that the kids can say, I want to do just the, the fall play or the, the spring show, and then they pay per show. And then what could we do with that? Um, the money, where would it, it uh, go? And I don't know exactly how this all you know, works, but this is definitely something that I'd like to add to the conversation. So, and, and I'm so glad to hear that you understand the urgency because mm -hmm. this, I mean, there needs to be a short-term fix and a long-term mm -hmm. fix. We can't afford to, to lose Andrea McCoy. She's amazing, yeah. so thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Clifford. I live at 14 Remsen Ave. And just to jump off of Julie Sinnett's point about uh, the opportunities for spe special education students, I don't think there's another one that has this formal approach where there are buddies who just sign up to mentor someone. I mean, every special needs student has a buddy who is specially selected for them. Um, my daughter, Jane, was a mentor this year, she directed the buddy program and just put hours into matching up each child with someone who would support him or her well. We have them working with us in the lobby. You know, they are our front of the house staff. They're just inspiring, I think working with Abby at the concessions table, for me, is as much fun as watching the shows. I know for Jane, she's as inspired by those kids as she is by the theater experience. And I, I, I'm, she's planning to major in social work and wants to work with the special um, ed community. And I think largely that's because of the exposure she's had through the theater program. And it's not just a casual thing, it's, it's formal. You know, they're well supported there. Their parents feel comfortable dropping them off. And knowing that there is a system in place, there are adults in charge, there are, there's a structure for the students to support them. And I can't think, what else would they do, you know, after school and feel invested in the school community if they didn't have theater? I can't think of anything else that provides that level of support for them. And I know all of the students are really proud to be a part of that as much as they're proud of their experience in the pit band or on stage or, you know, overseeing sound and lights. So I think that's an essential component that um, really supports a whole nother community that people might not even think about when they think about the theater program. Thank you. I'll be quick. I'm Lisa Perdella. I live at 2 Flintlock Lane. Um, just two quick things. You know, we talked a lot about community um, and inspiration. Um, certainly, um, theater is a community, and I think it's beyond just the school. It's the town. And we spent the first hour of this meeting talking about some scary things, and at a time when kids have a lot to be afraid of, anything that we can do as a community that gives them inspiration, that gives them something to be connected to, that's what they hang on to at a time when they're afraid. Um, as far as this director goes, I think the best thing I can say is, you know, I've visited, I've gone to some of the productions at the other towns we talked to, and I've always been blown away. I've always thought, oh my God, that's an amazing, phenomenal production. And we've always put on good performances because we have talent, talented kids. This year, we've been putting on amazing, incredible productions. And the way, the proof for that is my parents go to everything. My daughter's been in theater for three years. And my parents loved it, and, my, they, and they're older now, and they fall asleep during everything. My mother turned around to me afterwards, and she said, that was the best production Medfield has ever done. And I said, that's because you didn't sleep through it. And they had a good reason. So. Which is first, right? Yes. <laughs> Keep Andrew McCoy. Thank you.
want to say last year I met with uh, Robert Parga. We had a meeting and uh, we were just talking about various things and then he had mentioned that the one thing that ke was keeping him up at night was who was going to replace the woman who was retiring last year. Mm -hmm. He's like, Anime, you do not understand how critical this role is for the high school and, and it has to be right the first time. So it, it's, it's, it was fascinating. I thought, oh my gosh, well, what's he going to do? Is he going to call it the... Anyway, so I'm, I'm very grateful. You, your kids were phenomenal. Anyways, bravo. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, unless the, unless the candidate for director's, uh, director of student services here, I, I'd like to recommend we move to the budget update because I think it's, I'd like to do that while we have these folks here because I think it's germane to. Sure. Okay. She and uh, the candidate is not here, so okay. we can move right. the budget ahead. Thank you so much. I, it was such a tribute to her for um, to have such support for the community. Um, and uh, I always think whenever after I year see, one, right? Yeah. Year. right, right <laughs> after the first year, yeah. which can be a difficult yeah. year for anybody anywhere. So, um, such a beautiful tribute of support for her. Um, and I am always amazed. And um, every time I walk through the hallways and see the art, and um, I see a performance, that I'm amazed at the work. Um, that our students do and how talented they are. Um, so I, I love the passion and the support for someone that you believe in, so thank you. Um, and now let's move to the budget presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, we've had a few budget presentations in the last few months. Um, in your packet you have um, a, a few scenarios that we, we should discuss this evening and, and, and get to a place where we can make decisions. Um, as you know, last Thursday night, uh, the Warrant Committee voted unanimously to support a 4% increase to our budget. Um, so the first scenario that um, we looked at uh, was the 4% increase, which is the cut of additional cut of $284,000, and that, that is, gets us from the 4.86% to the 4%. So, we got to look at where that, that 284 is going to come from. Uh, we've talked about uh, additional personnel cuts. Where we got, we cut uh, 580,000 to get down to the 4.86 percent. So that 4 percent drops us another uh, $284,000, which, you know, in our mind right now, maybe a little technology, but there's got to be some personnel in there as well. That has to be based on what the reductions we made. Uh, the second that, that also means that you don't fund any teachers in the. You're eliminating at four percent. You have to eliminate at least a cluster at the middle school, and not add well, elementary school. We would have we would have to discuss what that looks like. I mean, it could be one or the other. Um, it wouldn't be both. So we'd have to make a decision on that and see what we would have to reduce. Uh, the the four point eight six percent gets back to the cuts that we had made uh, what a month ago, and uh, I guess now, where there were three hundred ten thousand dollars in cuts in payroll. Um, so that was the director of curriculum position. That was the curriculum office secretary, sick leave buyback, the unit A change, and the substitutes for professional developments. That all added up to 310,000. And then the non-payroll reductions were 270,000, the total reduction of 581. Now, that 581, um, we added in the, the middle school teachers. So that cluster, so that we made that a whole three cluster group in sixth grade instead of the two cluster group that we had talked about mm -hmm. before. Uh, so that adds 232,000 back in. That gets us back to the 486, which was the last budget that I presented to you folks, but no one voted on it. So that, there's been no vote on that budget, but that, that's scenario number two. Uh, number three it gets us back to 5.7%. Uh, so that scenario is the 4.86% budget uh, plus additional grade four and grade five teacher and then reinstating the curriculum director position. So, you know, part of the thinking behind this is is that if we're going to go for 18 or 19 students in grade six, you know, philosophically I have a hard time going to 23, 24 kids in elementary school. Now, do I think that 23 or 24 can work? Absolutely can work. Do I think our kids would be well served with 23 at Dale Street? Sure. But if we're going to have class size at 19, 20, 21 in the lower grades, and then we're going to get to the middle school and have 18, 19. I just have a hard time 
living with the fact that we're going to have higher grade levels and, and higher class sizes in grades four and five. So um, that budget puts a new another teacher in grade four, another teacher in grade five, and then reinstates the curriculum director position, which was removed out of the 4.86% budget. The final scenario, um, again, as we're going up the ladder here, uh, the 6.16% budget. Um, so that's, an, that's the gap now becomes 713,000. So the gap between the 4% the Warren Committee approved and what the 6.1 is, is uh, a little over 700,000. So that, again, that's the first, that's the fourth and fifth grade teacher at Dale Street um, that re reinstates the curriculum person and then adds another 150,000 to look at so additional security upgrades within the district. So in the last three years, you folks have approved and supported $100,000 in, in, in uh, security upgrades divided over three years. So FY16, FY17, FY18, we spent $100,000 doing security upgrades. Um, this budget, again, goes back to what the 4.86 is, but as the fourth and fifth grade teacher reinstates uh, the curriculum person and then adds an additional 150 uh, to us to look at some upgrades, some of which came out of last Friday, quite frankly, some of the issues that we got to fix out of that. Um, so that, that gets you to the 6.1%, uh, which is a full 2.1 over what the Warren Committee has now approved, um, and that gap is 713,000. So that's, you know, those are the four scenarios that we've, we've worked on. Um, I appreciate your feedback. Right, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. You know, um, for some time in this town, it's been, a, um, it's been a point of pride that Medfield has, we have outstanding schools with um, substantially below the state average in expenditure per student. The most recent data is um, from 2016. It was in the budget presentation. You can get it on clear.gov. Um, if you want to see, but just to compare, Medfield, the last, most recent data was 2016. We spent about 14,000 per student. Right. Um, Norwell over 15,000, Sudbury over 15,000. Um, virtually every town on the list we got earlier um, is well over 16 to, and, and 17, and in some cases 18 and 20,000, with the exception of Ashland, I should, should say. Um, it's never been a point of pride for the school committee that our per pupil expenditure is so low. Um, I have been guilty this year and in past years of um, vilifying the Warrant Committee to a certain extent um, because the Warrant Committee sets our, they, they, they advise town meeting and that's really all they do. Their, rec their, their role as an appointed body by the moderator is to advise town meeting on a balanced budget. And it's their view, and it has been for quite some time, that the only way they can balance the entire um, budget for the town of Midfield would cost that that, are out, that they don't entirely control, including um, some unfunded mandates and, and health insurance costs that are escalating faster than 2.5%, that the school district's budget can't grow more than, than 4%. And, and you know, I, I have said that we should advocate to the Warrant Committee to, to raise that, um, and I myself have several times advocated, sometimes calmly and sometimes not, um, with the Warrant Committee to raise um, that level of participation in the budget. This year, I, you know, having been to um, the, the budget hearing on our budget and having talked to members of the Warrant Committee, um, members of the Board of Selectmen, I don't know that they're going to be able to come up with, there's no magic pool of money in Medfield. We don't have any uh, commercial tax base to speak of. Um, there's no way for us to find more than 4% to fund the things we need. And I cannot support a budget that's 4%. I just can't. I can't, I, frankly, I can't, and, and I made this clear at the last meeting, I can't support the 4.8% budget. Um, so what I'd like to do, I think what we need to do is have Jessica and I, who are the members of the, the budget sub finance subcommittee, um, meet with a rep representation, representative from the Board of Selectmen to try to talk about whether it's time for an override. We haven't had one, an operational override in this town since in seven years. Some people tell you it's six years. It's act. It's definitely seven years mm -hmm. because Marianne Sullivan ran the last campaign before she was on the, the school committee. School committee can't really run a political campaign, which is why I wanted you all to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeking volunteers, yeah. and there's a real problem. I'll say this, and I, there's and you are not. You're obviously not guilty to, of it because you're here, and you're also active in the theater. But there's a real problem in Medfield right now with um, volunteerism. Um, there's not, you know, you see the same people that, I, I taught CCD, I coached, 
I'm here, I shepherd, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not doing, I'm doing far less than a lot of you are. Um, I work full time in Boston, uh, Anna Mae and I chaperone the canoe trip together. Um, you see the same people doing, the, filling a lot of roles in this town and there's a real problem I think with um, people not stepping up and they, they, people want more and more. Um, but there is, you can't just give more and more. You can't ask, ask more and more of you all. I'll tell you, you can't ask more and more of me um, and my family and the rest of the people up here, the family. So I do think it's time that after you know seven years on, um, we start to think about an operational override to try to get to um, this 6.16% budget. I think, you know, from my perspective, and you know, I asked Dr. Mars, and I've been he and I have been talking a lot about school safety, and I asked him to, to put together some some numbers for the school safety. I, you know, I, the hundred thousand dollar commitment we made three years ago, I I was quite proud of that. Less so today. Less so today. I mean, Parkland was voted the week before it happened as literally the safest city in Florida. Um, we're a pretty safe, pretty damn safe city, pretty town, um, and it doesn't fill me with a great deal of confidence, uh, comfort. Um, so I, that's why I think we, you know, we, we need to do that. And I think that if you do that, if you get the school district um, to a point where this year you have a significant increase. Then you can have a few years where you have you can have predictability. Maybe you can enter some kind of agreement with other boards. You can have some predictability and grow by four percent, but you can't do it in the absence of that. You, you all you may know some most of you have kids who are in high school, so you're sort of my, of my generation. The last override, most of that money was um, a one-time expense, right? We we bought computers and smart boards, none of which are really state of the art now. Seven years ago. Um, and by doing that, by putting that in the operational budget, we created an ability to grow the budget smaller as a percentage uh, over the next several years because you had a one-time expense that was then free for operating um, expenses the next year. Because the truth is, when we talk about stipends, which I know is important to many of you tonight, 4% is less than, or maybe it's, about, it's a little less than, it's about what just steps and lanes. Forgetting your cost of living increase, forget doing anything with stipends. 4% allows us just to, with the staff we on, have on today, pay for steps and lanes. If, if some of you weren't at the budget, so I could give you a whole lesson on teacher contracts and what steps and lanes are, but I, it's getting late and it's gonna start snowing about a half hour, so I won't. <laughs> Feel free to call me. Um, I was a teacher, it was a long time ago. I don't, you know, I don't know enough about classrooms now, but I did, um, I was actually in my first year on the teacher side negotiating a contract. And then my first year in Newton, I was on the teacher side negotiating a contract. And here I've negotiated several, I don't know, two or three. Um, and I think that unless we do something to uh, clear up what's clearly a, an operational deficit, now we're gonna be in a much, first of all, we're gonna be in an untenable position next year. I will not vote, I will not vote, and I could be outvoted, I will not vote for a, a budget of 4% for the district. No. I don't think anybody, and I've talked to everybody on, on the table, I don't think anybody up here will. At the same time, you can't, there's no money, right? It's, if there's no money, there's no money. The only way to raise money in this town is to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not anxious to have my taxes raised any more than anybody else is, but I think um, that's, what, that's why we live here. And that's the commitment people make when they move here. And before I was on the school committee, there was a series of overrides after overrides after overrides. It got to be I think more than most people could bear. And I certainly understand, I want to make it clear because I'm going to hear from people, I understand the problems of people with fixed incomes. I truly do. My mother-in-law is on a fixed income, my mother's headed there, and raising taxes for them has a certain sense of unfairness. Um, and I understand that. At the same time, property values are closely tied to the school district. They were, how many of you were at the, how many of you at the presentation that the school committee, uh, the, the hearing on the school committee budget and the warrant committee? There was a Warren Committee member who said, these guys will back me up, that you've done a great job with the school department. We've got, we've hit great numbers. We are a highly ranked district. I think it's time for you all to really get tight on the budget because it won't be so bad if we drop a few points. It won't be so bad if we drop a few points. And I, you know, I, I respect that, that Warren Committee member. He's, he works very hard and he is, um, uh, he has a different constituency than I do. Um, but I'm not here. I haven't been here for the last eight years to let that happen. Um, so, Madam Chair, I, I don't think it, we can vote on the budget. 
because we need to get an override. Well, we can vote on a 4% budget if you want. Um, right now, God bless you, I think the budget we voted is 5.8%. 5.8%. 5.79. 5.79. 5.79. 5.79. 5.79. Uh, but my preference would be to take no further action but to have to authorize Jessica and I go talk to um, to meet with the representatives of the, the board of selectmen to talk about getting an override on a special election ballot. We all know we're going to have a special election in May anyway. Right. Um, so you save the cost of doing a separate uh, election. Um, I'll stop giving a speech and hear from others. Um, one, of, one of the other things I, I really have to say is as I've researched school funding, and as I have sat in virtually every Warren Committee meeting for the last several months, uh, which is fascinating, if you. you ever want to learn what you need to know about Medfield, go to the Warren Committee meetings, because then you hear every single part of what goes into this town. For instance, Chris and I were both there when we learned that it actually costs us twice as much to recycle as it does to just throw something away per ton anymore because of how China is now shipping the, our main purchaser of recyclables is now shipping them back to us. They don't really want them. So there's a lot of really interesting little details to this. But the one thing that I've really seen and noticed and realized is that much of our economy has um, recovered since 2008, 2009. School funding never has. Largely municipal funding hasn't, but certainly school funding has never recovered. We are still operating at the levels in which everyone cut everything they could because things looked so bad. And I think in some ways, our economy has been filled a little bit on the backs of, of cutting everything else, right? I don't, I, I honestly, I struggle with, with thinking about raising taxes. I really do. I hear, I hear our elders and our seniors. I feel terribly that we have not, as a community, served them in the way that we should. That is a long-range problem, though. And Medfield is currently a company town. And what we do is that we educate kids incredibly well. And we have amazing staff. And we have incredible programs. We need to fund those. And we need to fund them honestly and we need to fund them to the extent that our kids deserve. And so if we can go back to lower budget increases, but we need a catch up, we need a catch up. That's, that's my feeling. The more I listen, the more I understand the kind of holistic ideal of what it is we need to do for our schools. We need to fund so that we can continue to manage costs in the future. So that's just my feeling about it. Um, so I am wondering if the um, if Jess and Chris, if you two go back um, even to the selectmen or because the idea, when, and when you listen to what Chief Meany presented tonight um, and the needs to improve our security, um, you know, the additional teachers, the additional funding that we need, if there, ideally there would be some kind of longer term arrangement um, for our budgets. You know, if we're, if we're going back and asking for um, yeah, I considerably think higher. I hear what you're saying, and you, you can't, I mean, I think we need it as a committee to make a, be willing to make a commitment that if we, you know, if, if we, we move for an override this year, mechanically so you all know, we'd have to vote a budget, we'd then go to town meeting, and hopefully all you, you would too, and all mm -hmm. of your friends, and, your and friends. get babysitters if you need them. Gosh darn it, I've been saying it for a year the, now. The budget would have to pass <laughs> town meeting um, you know, just by my majority. Mm -hmm. And then uh, would have to pass, um, because it would require an increase in taxes of greater than 2.5%, right. it would have to be um, approved as a special mm -hmm. election, um, presumably sometime in May. Um, which will happen anyway because of the Dale Street because feasibility Dale Street study. Yeah. So there'll be a special election for that anyway. But I think, you know, in fairness, um, let's start with the Warren Committee, because again, I think the Warren Committee's job is to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. And if we find, you know, if taxes are a way to add, it, add to the budget, then we help them balance the budget. Mm -hmm. But I think in fairness to the, the Board of Selectmen who have a separate budget and a lot more departments that they, mm -hmm. they have to fund, um, I think we need to find a way to have some 
if we if we do successfully get an override this year for FY19 to have some predictability for some fixed period years. And I think we need to talk to the selectmen about how that would be. I think mechanically, we uh, Jessica and I would talk to them um, and then come back to this committee at our next meeting, or if necessary, at a special meeting before then. I think we'll probably take till that, that next meeting to get things, get them. Uh, I know they don't have a meeting tomorrow night um, to think about their budgeting as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we could, I think then, that we shouldn't vote on a budget tonight until um, the two of you talk, I guess, out further with the selectmen and um, with whomever may have an appetite to discuss this um, further. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think we're going for an override operationally anyways because the numbers don't work. For and the I think it's uh, not for just for the schools, but for the well, I think in general, in yeah, general, but predominantly yeah. for the schools. But I think that, you know, I think if we're going to pull the band aid off, we should pull it off quickly and we get a, and we've done things strategically traditionally. And I think I like Chris's idea of sort of looking at a long term, you know, if that can work in terms of talking about setting us up in a way that there's some predictability in the budget process for the schools and for the town, and it, and it recognizes that. You know, it's not a bottomless pit, as we're reminded every time we go to the Warren Committee. Yeah. So, um, and right. But, but I think that, and I think that's right, yeah. But I think that uh, I like that idea of kind of creating uh, a mechanics around some sort of a longer term solution. So we're not going back year after year for overrides. So, mm -hmm. so Jeff, not to, or Dr. Marsden, not to put you on the spot, um, if you've given this number in the past, in order to get Medfield's per pupil expenditure the state average, Mm -hmm. How much? What, what? What would the? What's the difference in our spending? Do you remember? It's in your budget for the yeah. I think the, the budget would go up sixteen percent or something. It was to get seventeen percent. Was it seventeen percent? Seventeen yeah. point. So this won't get us anywhere close to the state yeah. average, but um, Wait, and I can probably probably will never get there. Four million, Michael. I forget what it was. It was a hefty it's amount true. that got us to. If we spent the average amount, where our budget would go. And I think you know when you don't spend that average amount and you you spend lower. This is how you get into situations where stipends are a lot lower because. You get negotiations, you're looking at cost of living, steps and lanes, longevity, all that, and then stipends get put to the side because you can't afford them because you've dealt with all that other stuff first. And I think that's, and that just compounds contract after contract after mm -hmm. contract. So there's no adjustment in terms of cost of living increase. None of that gets done on the stipends. And then you have what we have now where y you have folks that have gone together for a year and a half to try to benchmark against everyone else and get it to a level that's acceptable for us. And acceptable for the for the town of Medfield. I mean, I think we're getting a great product out of our, our folks that are doing the siphons, whether it's through the arts or whether it's curriculum wise. And you know, we need to make sure the compensation is there too. And I think that's what we're trying to do. But that's, I mean, that's when you do it. Forgive yeah, me. When you do it on the cheap. Do it, when you do it on the cheap. This is the kind of what happens. You do it, frankly, with you know, um, a lot of the boosters organizations, the theater parents, the music parents, the you know, the, the athletic boosters, MCP. We couldn't do. Imagine what our budget would be if we didn't take grants from all those organizations and MCPs. Right. You know, and I and I'm you know, reaching into my neighbor's pockets at a party every year to have them contribute to MCPE at a you know an E for E event. They actually get to drink a little bit of scotch at the same time, so that they seem to not mind it. But um, you know, that's what we do as a town. Is we're not only are we all paying taxes, but many of us are also reaching into our pockets to fund no question. other organizations. And, and not so much the budget, it's experiences for kids. Right. So imagine what the experience for kids would be like if we didn't have all those organizations. Right. Mm -hmm. It would be totally different. would be the Medfield you see now, mm -hmm. that's for sure. So, um, Madam Chair, is it possible to make a public comment? Um, sure. You can I'll be brief. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you can be agreeing with Chris. So. <laughs> That alone should be, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jerry Potts, Seven Curve Street. So, Chris, I've heard for two years, and I don't think anyone's been more eloquent speaking about the underfunding. I think I was at that same Warren Committee meeting, and what's troubling about it is we've put a lot of pressure on the school committee and the superintendent to step up on special education and social emotional. If you just took care of the basic spending, it was going to go up. But then we asked you to take care of special education because we underspent for years. And it was unfair. And it was immoral. It, it was a wrong way to treat our community. So if you added special education, which you have, 
and social emotional learning, which we need, you can't do business as usual. Even if you're investing in technology, you're doing these other things, taking care of those two things, which this community overwhelmingly has said they want you to do, you need to spend for it. And unfortunately for Medfield, we have underspent in those two areas for years because someone thinks it's a great thing to say we do it more cheaply than anyone else. And as a result of that, we've treated certain components of our, of our, our student base um, with less dignity. So I appreciate you speaking up um, as you have over the past couple of years. I have an 89-year-old mother in town who's paying taxes. Um, I certainly understand the pressures. Um, but we owe our kids, and we don't owe them 25 kids in a class. We don't owe, owe special education is like, we'll get to it. Um, so I, I, I applaud you. Thank you. Don't applaud me, because nothing happens unless um, we can make it happen, and then you all can. If, we, if, if town meeting votes a full percent budget for us, um, we're going to lose a lot of programs. And you know, a lot of you have come in front of us looking for more, uh, more teachers. and. Some of you have said, um, we've gotten a lot of emails saying cut this, cut that, mm -hmm. um, cut things like elementary school guidance counselors, cut uh, elementary school language programs. There are members on the, the Warren Committee who wants to cut um, language programs, uh, whole, so not all language programs, but they'd like us to stop teaching Mandarin, for example. Um, those are hard decisions, which I will make. I've been here for eight years. I don't mind making them. I prefer not to. So um, if we do go forward, and I hope you come, Bring more friends to the next meeting. I think if we do get to a point where next meeting we're going to vote on a budget that includes a, uh, an operational override, we, we don't have any reason to call or requirement to call another public hearing. But I think we ought to, you know, put the word out to, to parents that that's what we expect. Maybe people put that out mm -hmm. in all school um, blast and and hold the equivalent of another hearing so that people can um, can weigh in because you know, look, one way or the other, we're going to get the the budget in this town that people will, the people of the town will support. And so if we lose a town meeting or we lose it at the, at the, at the ballot box, then you know, that, that's a message to us and, and we'll live with it. I hope that's not the message that mm -hmm. you and your neighbors and friends send. So is there a possibility of having an additional meeting before April 2nd? Maybe we want to keep that open just in case we need to do that or? I think we need to see how things go with the right. board of selectmen. Okay. I know they've put a uh, they've, they've put a, a warrant article on hold that would that would pass uh, that would support putting a, a, a measure on the ballot, but they only the board of selectmen can vote to put an override on the ballot. Right. Well, thank you both for going back and reworking this. I know that this budget season has been long. Um, maybe a little bit longer, longer um, yeah. than some, but um, all for the greater good. So thank you. Thank you um, very folks. much. Um, that being said, I hope you're as eloquent with the uh, selection. Selection. And I trust that you will. Um, we'll see. So, all right, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from February. I haven't had a chance to review my move to the table. I know we are bouncing it, but now I'm going back to the original. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't have my voice from <laughs> I moved to the table minutes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. So moved. Table. Wait, we have big news coming up. I know. Well, yeah, yeah, you know you would hear. We do. This is, this is open bar. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's not anywhere close to our normal oh, spending time. Are you kidding me? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I get you to pass an override. That's how I get you to pass an override. Right. Susan Kalski can move. Um, so the next yeah. item on yeah. the agenda is the appointment of the Director of Student Services. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, you had the information from Mary Brule. Uh, Mary Brule is the current uh, Director of uh, Secondary Special Education for the Dedham Public Schools. Um, I want to just first thank all the members of, of the screening committee, which was um, chaired by Nat Vaughn, and we had some great parents and teachers a part of that. That sent um, two finalists uh, to Jess, Marianne, and me, um, and we, we spent some time um, interviewing both candidates, spent an entire day with each of them, took them around to all the schools, um, had them meet the teachers, the kids, had lunch with them, and, and really got a sense of what they were all about. Um, 
so we're happy to uh, to promote to the to the disc to the uh, school committee uh, Mary Brewell, who um, I think is going to be a great fit here in Medfield. Uh, parents gave us some really great feedback on on the meeting with her because part of it was meeting with some special education parents and members of CPAC, and they were very very excited after and sent me emails and I know sent you folks emails as well. Um, so with this appointment, um, you would allow me to have contract negotiations with Mary and hopefully get her on board. She would start July 1. Um, she's actually, um, uh, she'll finish up on June 30th in, in Denham and uh, she would start here on July 1. So we're just really excited about it. Um, I know it's been kind of a long process for us the last couple of years going through a couple of interims. Uh, but we think we found the right person for the job and looking forward to, to working with Mary and Mary working with our kids and our staff. So. I would ask you to approve uh, Mary Brewer. And would answer any questions if you have. I know you have all the material. Yeah, she's, I mean, I, that was a, I was a big packet of material. I actually printed half of it. I read yeah. it all on my, on my screen. Um, I started to feel old when I looked that she went, got a master's degree at BC. And I thought, oh, maybe we had, maybe we had her first master's. I thought, oh, maybe we had some, you know, we went to, had some classes together. No. Not so much. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> made me feel, that, that made me feel a lot like. But I do like to see, you know, I went to BC, my wife went to Leslie, and she, she should take both those boxes um, in addition to a couple other schools. And um, her recommendations are stellar. just stellar. So. Right. Stellar. And one of the things that we do when, um, when we, we vet a candidate like this is we, we all have networks of administrators, and we know where she worked, not just Dedham, but also in Natick, and, and did some checking on folks that with folks that didn't appear on her references. So we get a really good sense of what, it, and they were all, you know, very, very good, hardworking, smart, works well with people. So all the, all the things that we're looking for and I'm really excited about it. I think she's the only graduate of the Winch School with a higher GPA than Chris. <laughs> I think you're assuming all too much. You haven't, you haven't seen mine from the Winch School. <laughs> um, I have to say, I, I felt as though when I was walking with Mary and when I was, even just at the very beginning of the day, I literally felt like I was in the presence of somebody who was so intelligent mm -hmm. and so, and that was my first impression. And you're like, okay, well that's good. There are a lot of really bright people around here, but she is so directed and she really had a mind for kind of data and facts and she was really understanding and kind of explaining things. And then she sat down with the parents um, that day. And then you saw her light come on. So she was, you know, very professional and s smart. I mean, I think that's the thing that we kept on saying, mm -hmm. this woman is just right. And then her light came on when she started talking about the kids she's interacted with, the things that give her meaning, the ways that she has done education and planning with general ed classroom teachers as well as special ed teachers and how she integrates them. And she could give specific examples around what that was like for her. And, and as you kind of just progressed through that conversation, you realize that this is a woman who is passionate about delivering service and making sure that that service is a, what that child needs. And how does it impact an entire <coughs> district? How does it impact an entire classroom? Where are the places that you can integrate and really bring the whole classroom up? And I think that that was where I was the most impressed. I spent a lot of time thinking about special ed in the last ever many years. And I felt a sense of this, this is a promising, promising person. Mm -hmm. So that's my spiel. Um, I would second that and just to add that um, as we were walking around the, in, in after some of the parent meetings, the, the feedback that, that even I personally received from parents that pulled me aside and said, you know, we cannot let her escape this district. So much right. like you have the same passion that you expressed here, I think that um, in addition to um, being a Holy Cross graduate. Um, <laughs> she's gone to a lot of schools. Um, just, just she's to been to know. many, many schools, but I, I did, ha I wanted to love her because of that, but I kept an open mind. Um, but, uh, um, and it, it, it's such an interesting, brilliant woman. Um, 
was actually a pre-med um, psychology major, so that ticked another little box for and Russian. Me. Um, amazing, um, and, but not only her credentials, but I think, and as we spent more time with her, um, and I can say her bedside manner, the way yes. that she um, interacted with people, and I thought that if I was to have a meeting, I would want her sitting across the table from us. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that this will, um, and I believe that this will be the person that as far as our strategic plan and moving ahead mm -hmm. with that particular that has been so important and there's been so much work done on the strategic plan that that component of the plan as it moves forward, she will be an integral piece of attaining that goal. Um, and I hope that she receives a warm welcome and support from mm -hmm. the community, which I'm sure she will. Um, so and she lives in Medway nice and close, which is great. Right. I mean, she'll be very accessible. Right. And right. She will be a warm and welcome and brilliant addition to um, our team here in Mid Hill. So, I move and I, I also just one more thing: mm -hmm. um, is it possible to have her um, come to talk to the school committee or just announce kind of her presence sure. before um, the end of the year? She is. She is due <laughs> next week. Yes. Their second child. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and the fact that she went through that day with us and yeah. Yeah. never. never yeah, she was. She was a machine. She was. Dr. Oh God, put me to shame. Dr. Marsden, this isn't one of the positions that we approve, right? You're just, you just, you yeah, appoint. We do, oh, we do appoint. You yeah. appoint. You do. So you threw me off. Right, then I move the committee's subcommittee's recommendation. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Two years later. Yeah. I am no, so thank you. Yeah. If you don't have a kid with disabilities in the district, you don't know how exciting that was. Yeah. But <laughs> it's been a two years. It's been a long time. Really well, it's been, it's but been the yeah. search has been two years. The <laughs> search has been two years, but it has a been a process so since I have been in the district. She has accepted the position, or she will. Are you, she, she, uh, she will. I, I've been talking to her. She will. Absolutely. Just wanted to that last right. Right. But, no, but nothing can be, <laughs> be official until that vote. Did so. you say you were right. going to marry me? What? <laughs> very exciting. Yes, very exciting. Right, thank you. District. And thanks to the, the screening committee involved. Yeah. A lot of work. Both screening committees. Yeah. It's great. Okay. Should give a little shout out to Tanya. Oh, yeah. mm. We spent a lot of time and has spent many hours over many years. <laughs> mm. yeah, a couple of meetings. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item, any, no, I, any item since posting on March seventh. No, no. Um, and so, old business. The only thing we have left are donations. Uh, I would ask that you um, <coughs> approve the following donations for Blake Middle School: five hundred dollars from Bryn Barrett. <laughs> I always love saying that every I year. Know. Uh, $725 from Blake PTO to Blake gift account. I'd ask that you approve, oh, sorry, one more. And $600 from Blake PTO to Blake gift account. I ask that you approve as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Next item on the agenda is the uh, superintendent's report to the committee. So just the um, informational uh, items, that one item was with Jerry, uh, Jerry's, uh, which we read an hour and mm -hmm. a couple hours ago. I went through all that. Uh, but I did want to update you just on full day kindergarten numbers. So we had registration. Uh, we, we cap out full day kindergarten at 20, 21 students. Um, right now it looks like, and we're just finalizing, I think we're finalizing today and tomorrow, or now Wednesday, uh, that we're probably gonna have to have a lottery for full day kindergarten. Um, so we have, we have 100, 147 slots, and we have the interest that is uh, a lot higher. Uh, looks to be about 100, 156 or so right now. Um, so I mean, one way you could deal with this is cap it at 22 no. instead of 21. Um, <laughs> just asking. But no. I wasn't asking, I was actually just saying it. Um, so I, I think what we're gonna do is, is really look at the 21 and then do a lottery. And so that's, that's what we're gonna have to do. You're in half day, you're, you're set. So we're all set? You're all set, yeah. Okay. It's just full day, yeah, just full okay. day. Okay. Well, I know I'm in half day, but I just want to know if I can like, over. Like, okay. I don't want to be like, all of a sudden I get oh, I full see what you're day, saying. like the afternoon. Gotcha, okay. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm, I think that the folks that put in for, for half day right now, their preferences are all set. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> uh, so that, I just want to let you know about that. That's going to be coming down. And we got, uh, I was told before this meeting that two more signed up the full day. Uh, so we're looking at, at a lottery, and, and that'll be a public lottery. You know, Missy will run that. Um, and, um, you know, we don't think we've had to have one since here, I feel, but uh, certainly is a I think we had one the first year. It, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was definitely an interest, and people are excited about the program, and, and they want to make sure that we can uh, get those folks who want to be in there. Yeah. So, and, and the other message is that um, in terms of the additional positions that we've added in elementary school, the numbers keep coming. So mm -hmm. we're going we're gonna to fill these classrooms, and um, the additional teachers that we've added, we really need to keep class size at a, at a reasonable number. Um, in, in terms of district recognition, I just have a few things. I just want to thank um, all the folks involved in Winter Carnival this weekend. You know, really exciting weekend with them and all three elementary schools involved in it now. And all the teachers that took time out of their weekend to go to that, that's it's fantastic. Uh, we've already talked about Pippin tonight, but that was really something. Um, another, another great production from the Theater Society. It's incredible how talented our kids are. Just, you know, a pleasure to be there and see what they can do. Um, DLD is coming on April 10th, uh, Digital Learning Day, so that's, we're pretty excited about that and we have a team of people that have been working real hard on that um, and I'll send you some of the information. They, they've just uh, listed all the different workshops that are going to be taking place during that day, but we're really excited about that. Uh, again, great, great event. We have now people from, you know, 30 or 40 districts coming to see what our teachers are doing and showcase the great work they're doing, so uh, we're using... Um, uh, social emotional learning is part of what we're, we're doing this year as well as part of the themes. I uh, just want to congratulate all our students in the fall sports teams. Uh, hockey lost yesterday. They had a great win on Friday, but ended up losing uh, yesterday, so we have no teams left in the tournament. But our alpine skiing, our gymnastics team, mm -hmm. girls basketball, boys basketball, uh, just a great, great winter season, so I want to congratulate all of them. Um, uh, looking forward to a couple events coming up. Uh, Bandorama, which I assume is going to be postponed tomorrow evening since we cancel, cancel everything. Uh, one of the, to me, that's probably the best um, mm -hmm. musical performance we have all year because you get to see the progression in the same room. It's just really, really neat. Um, so we're going to reschedule that, and String Fling is on Wednesday night, so looking forward to that. Um, and then the last thing, I, I just want to you know, mention how proud I am of our students in the middle school, high school, that just so maturely uh, put together a plan and worked with our principals on the student walkout for the, yeah. for the 14th. Um, you know, they, it was really student driven and um, you know, the, the, leader, the leadership was outstanding. They want to make a difference. We want to support them in making a difference. Um, and, and I think that our principals and staff did a great job to, um, to massage it so it works well and it's safe for all kids. And, and that's all kids. Some kids may not agree with it, but we, we have provisions in for those children as well. And I think it, it's just a, a really good event that um, we're proud of our kids. And it was student-led, student, it's just, just fantastic. After my meeting with DPW today, I'm hoping we get school in on Wednesday. Um, they're concerned about that because if it is truly 18 inches tonight and tomorrow, it's going to be really difficult um, for those people that are working all night to get the school open. And I think our DPW was second to none. Yeah. And for them to say that to me, then they're, they're concerned about it because they're always, yep, yeah, we can do it, Jeff, we can do it, Jeff. Um, so they're just a little concerned with the amount of snow and the timing and the fact that it's number three, you know, right in a row. So we'll see how that goes. But um, again, there's a plan if we don't have school on Wednesday for those students to still um, do what they planned and, and uh, exercise their, their right. So we're real pleased about that. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Would, if we did Wednesday, that would be our fifth. Uh, snow day, is that correct? No. Four. No. Four. Fourth? Fourth. 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 Okay. Yes. One of the years are seeming long. We're ahead of other districts. Yeah, it'll just feel like my Other districts are in five or six. It'll feel like the fifth. Okay. Yeah. Oh, zero. So we had that, when it was two days off for a lot of districts, we had that release, right. uh, that um, late start that day. Right. Um, so Wise. We're, we're okay with that. Wise. So, um, going down the line, James, do My you neighbor who, who doesn't care whether we have another story. Right, right, you're hoping for a couple more, right? <laughs> Keep bringing them on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> While I have you all here, I believe this is my largest audience of the year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> student Council is hosting Putty for Patients this right. Sunday right. in the high school gym. Um, and that's one of our, our biggest events of the year, and we really look to get the, the whole community at the gym there. Um, you can register online. 
There should be something coming out in the Thursday packet this mm -hmm. week um, with the link to register. It's dis you get a discount if you register online. So tell your friends, tell your neighbors. And it's on for concerned citizens. And it's, it's on concerned citizens, yes. Yeah. Um, and all the proceeds from that go to the Jimmy Fund. So you have cabin fever after this weather. <laughs> <laughs> um, in other news, this Friday, uh, Student Council is hosting the freshman and sophomore semi formal dance. Big moment to every freshman and sophomore. <laughs> 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 um, so we're selling tickets for that at lunch at uh, MASC, the Massachusetts Student Council Conference in Hyannis. Uh, last week we won gold council at Medfield, so we were recognized as. Again. 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 And then just in senior news, not student council based, but the fashion show is this Saturday. So if you're looking for anything to do, you can go to the fashion show on Saturday and then play mini golf on Sunday. So the whole weekend can be school. <laughs> Seven. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> I sell the tickets. <laughs> and thanks to James thanks, for James. hanging out for as long as he does. We want to be anywhere else. <laughs> 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 I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say I, I want to thank um, Mr. Pargett. Um, I know some students were troubled that he sent out an email sort of laying out how the, the protest would go on Wednesday. And I, you know, I remember what civil disobedience was like mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And you had, you, the whole point was not to have permission, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I, I know Dr. Uh, Mr. Parker met with several students, my daughter among them, so that's how I know. Um, and and you, well, the program, if you will, for the walkout truly was put together by the students. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's just incumbent, especially given the, the circuit, the, the circumstances under which it's happened, to make sure that the, the school, you know, sort of knows about it and is helping to organize it and keep it safe. Mm -hmm. um, more so now that there may be 18 inches of snow on the ground, but I think, you know, some districts are worried about um, the consequences of students all being in one place at one time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important, it was important to me that he did send out that message, whether students choose to participate or not. Right. Um, so while I know some students were a little disappointed because they wanted to just be fighting the power, and I respect that. When I was a kid, they wouldn't let us wear ripped jeans in high school, so we all had to walk out. Um, the issues that are before our youth today are much more relevant, much more important, and I'm, I'm proud of my own daughter and, and all the other kids who are um, part of putting it together. Uh, this is, believe it or not, our last regularly scheduled meeting before the election, so I just wanted to uh, wish Marianne well. It's been a pleasure and an honor to serve with you for the last six years. Um, I know you, you sometimes take a beating, especially on Facebook, although I'm not on Facebook. Uh -huh. um, that seems to, to pass for activism these days, but you have been a true activist in terms of actually being present and being um, part of the growth and progression of this school district. You've been a great leader for the committee for the last two years, um, and I don't think anybody could ever seriously, in good conscience, question your commitment to this town and to this district uh, it's unfortunate that the elections seem to be taking on a more and more personal tone, and I think a lot of that, the internet has, has led to a lot of that, and you know, that's just, you know, I think it reflects the, the national uh, politics, which is unfortunate for us as, a, as, a, as an entire country, and it, unfortunately I think it's trickling down to Medfield um, in our discourse, and, and that's not the way it should be. We should be talking about issues, we should be talking about experience, um, people aren't doing that, and, and, and that's not fair. Um, I wish Leo luck. I think he's, you know, um, he's running a good campaign, and I, I respect him for doing it when nobody else has in quite a long time. Um, we had a lot of elections. A lot of elections have gone uncontested. Every other election in this town has gone uncontested. And again, I think that's both a testament to people um, doing a good job, but also a lack of involvement. And you've been, from the time your kids were in kindergarten through now, and I know. Um, Finn's still got a long way to go, mm -hmm. so you'll continue to be active, and I hope it's with us here on the committee. Um, so you certainly have my support. Thank you. Thank you. It's late. And I think we've acknowledged a lot, so maybe I'll keep mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I second uh, a lot what was said tonight, especially about the bin and the walkout. But then I got a text right now that the jazz band got gold tonight at District. So, <laughs> so that's it. Um, I, I just want to thank everyone for showing up um, and for such kind words. And, the, and I think also um, the support of our students um, in having a voice. They, they do so much, I think. Um, and I think I said it the other day, whether it's a theater event, whether you see um, a sports team, the, the level of class and um, style and the way they conduct themselves is a lesson that I think a lot of adults can learn from. Um, I, am, I am forever grateful for those lessons and that inspiration. Um, I think, again, like I said, I think a lot of adults can learn from the lessons that our kids are, um, currently engaging in. Um, I think to encourage student activism is amazing and I think to do it in a safe way um, helps us as parents, especially when we listen to what Chief Meany said for so long. Um, so I am grateful that we are allowing our students, especially our high school students who have a voice and they have a lot to say and it's meaningful um, to give them that voice because they turn into the future leaders, right? So, um, and to do so safely. I am grateful that everyone has done that for them um, and for us, so I'm appreciative. Um, that being said, our next meeting is Monday, April 2nd, 2018. Uh, future agenda items will continue to be the fiscal year 19 sure budget. Um, and is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.